Okay, so we'll be going live in three, two, and one. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, good, good evening. You've only just come back for one and you're being a troublemaker already. Stop it. Ladies and gentlemen, we are we are now live. It is 6 p.m. So um, if I could have your attention for the meeting. Um, my name is Peter Richards. I'm getting feedback, sorry. My name is Peter Richards and I will be chairing tonight's planning committee meeting. Um, it is a meeting in public, not a public meeting. So please, only those people that are registered to speak will be permitted to do so. At the appropriate time, I will call you forward to one of the three desks in front of you um, and uh, and you will have your allotted time. I'll let you know what your time is then. Um, when you sit down, if you uh, press the button in the middle of the microphone, it will go red and you will be able to be uh, you'll be able to speak and you'll be heard. And then again, if you could uh, press it to turn it off when you're done, that would be great. And if you could remain seated for questions, that would be also very helpful. Um, we're not expecting any fire alarms, so if one does go off, please follow us in an orderly fashion across to the car park over the road. We will need you to stay there so that we can check all your names off and make sure everyone has got out safely out of the building before we send you on your merry little way. Um, mobile phones, if you could please turn them to silent. Uh, off is preferable, but silent at the very least. I appreciate people sometimes need to use them. Feel free to do so, provided it doesn't uh, conflict with the uh, the proper procedures of, of the committee and, and, and put us off what we're trying to do. OK, um, and we are, of course, being recorded and live streamed uh, as we speak um, for, for later viewing. Amy Shipley, who is our solicitor, and in no particular order, our planners are as a, an expert on, on certain items um, and our planning manager who um, unfortunately contracted COVID uh, last night I think um, is joining us online. Our planning manager is Alice Cosnett. Alice I think you've probably got something you'd like to say a statement to make. Yes thank you Councillor. I just want to check you can hear me. Yes we can. Perfect thank you. Uh, so my role is to provide impartial advice and to assist members in their decision taking. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right, let's move into the full agenda. Um, so first of all, apologies for absence, please. We have apologies from Councillor Jennings, for whom Councillor Harvey is substituting, Councillor Rock, for whom Councillor Adam is substituting, Councillor Mills, for whom Councillor Cargill is substituting, and Councillor Hensher Serafin, for whom Councillor Wolf is substituting. Marvellous, thank you very much and welcome to our substitutes. Um, disclosures of interest members, do we have any disclosures please? Blimey, okay, I'm going to I'm going to go round if I may. So, Councillor Kendall first of all please. Thank you, it's a personal non-pecuniary, um, what do we call them? Dis disclosure of interest. Uh, the uh, applicant for uh, item number six, King Edward School, is known to me. I taught his daughter a few years ago. There we go. Thank you very much, Councillor Parry. Uh, thank you and good evening, Chair. Um, I wish to advise my interest in the um, planning application 22 forward slash 00748 forward slash vary. I am personally known to the neighbours of the um, application in question. I presume you'll be withdrawing from the uh, item. I shall be withdrawing from the committee, Marvellous. stepping down. Thank you. Understood. Thank you very much. Councillor Cargo. Thank you, Chair. Um, due to a late substitution, I was unable to attend the uh, organised site visits, but I have been uh, to Marriage Hill and Pulitan Prize to see the sites for myself. Marvellous. Thank you very much. Councillor Adam. Uh, uh, similarly, I wasn't able to attend the site visits. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Rolf. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I am the ward member for application 2104006, full the CARES application. Uh, I will step down because I will be speaking uh, on this application, so I will walk away from this seat. Thank you. Marvellous. Thank you. Councillor Harvey. Uh, I'm in the same position as um, Councillor Cargill. I was unable to attend the organised site visit, but I have independently visited sites in relation to applications four, five and seven. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Curtis. Oh, Thank you, Chair. Yes, just to say uh, application 22 slash 01984 slash Ludington Road. 
Um, I am the ward member for Shottery, Ludlings Road. That's in my ward, um, but I've had no um, contact with the applicant. Approach this with a completely open mind. I'm happy to stay in the meeting for that if that's acceptable, Chair. If you're here with that in mind, which you said you are, then yes, that's absolutely fine. Uh, Councillor Adam again. Forgive me, I forgot to mention I'm the ward member for item number five on the agenda, and so I'll be stepping down and speaking on that item. No problem. Thank you very much. Anyone else before I give mine? No. OK, so uh, on uh, application reference 21040006 FUL, that's King Edward School. Um, I used to coach cricket on that site. Um, I haven't done for 10 years, um, so uh, I just think it's important to make that known. Clearly, I'm here with an open mind, um, uh, so I will stay on the uh, agenda, on the um, uh, on the committee for that. Um, and it has become apparent today uh, that on application 22-00748 VERY, that is the um, land off Banbury Road in Pillars and Priors, um, it turns out that uh, I am a member of the same club as one of the neighbours. I also, it turns out, I'm on the same WhatsApp as uh, one of the neighbours. However, we've never spoken, we've, until today, until we met on site today, I'm here with a completely open mind um, and will remain on uh, uh, on the committee for that. Um, I have sought legal advice on that and that has been confirmed as acceptable. OK, let's move on to our minutes. Is everyone happy with the minutes are set out in the agenda? A quick show of hands. It looks like there's lots of nods. Yeah, I think that's agreed. Marvellous. Let's move to our first item then, which is application reference 2201071FUL. There's a land north of Marriage Hill in Bidford upon Avon. Our presenting officer... Have I got that the right way around? Yes. That's you, isn't it? Hey, presenting officer Stuart Flaherty. That's not your name on here. <laughs> Stuart, over to you. Thank you, Chairman. Good evening, everybody. Um, this proposal is seeking planning permission for the erection of three dwellings and associated development. Uh, the proposal involves the demolition of three barns that currently occupy the site. Um, here we see the approximate location of the site uh, signified by the black dot um, to the north of the B439. Uh, the application site is within the adopted built barrier boundary of Bidford and Avon, uh, with areas of open countryside to the north and west. Here we see the proposed site layout plan illustrating the three dwellings. This plan here shows the point of vehicle access um, that is to be used. Uh, this is an existing access track. Um, there is an area shaded in purple here where there is proposed to be widened to help accommodate vehicle access. Um, here we have some indicative visuals of the proposed development. Here we see the proposed elevational detail for plots one and two. And again, here we see the proposed elevations for plot number three. Um, here we see the proposed works to the point of access to include widening, uh, it's a little bit larger here in the area shaded purple, and the proposed bin collection point signified here. We now have some photos of the site and its surroundings. Um, here we are stood on the existing access track looking southwards back towards the B439. One can see uh, to the left, there are the back of some of the neighbouring properties off Harbour Close. Here we are stood in the crude centre of the application site looking southwards. Uh, one can see there are two barns here to the left and right that are proposed to be demolished as part of this proposal. Um, and again, here we see one of the barns in greater detail um, looking northwestwards. One can also see that there is swathes of open countryside to the north and west of the site. Um, here we are stood uh, outside the application site looking eastwards across the barns uh, here uh, where there is also a backdrop of further residential buildings um, in the wide, immediate and wider vicinity here. Um, finally, here we are stood at the point of vehicle access um, looking along the B439 both away from the village here on the left and towards the village centre here on the right. Um, having refused a scheme in this location that was materially the same as 12 months ago, it is officers' opinion that previous concerns on matters of highways have since been addressed and improved. The proposal is seeking to deliver three family homes of a sustainable location within the adopted village boundary of Bidford and Avon. Uh, I refer you all to the update sheet for details of the member site visit that took place this afternoon. Uh, Chairman, the recommendation is to grant this application for reasons set out on pages 15 and 16 of your agenda. Thank you. Stuart, thank you very much indeed. Let's call our first speaker of the evening, who is Councillor Ugaloos from Bidford Parish Council. Not a councillor, sorry, I do apologise. Miss Ugaloos. Uh, Miss Ugaloos, I think you've, you've been here plenty of times, you know the drill, so you'll have three minutes. I'll give you a 30 second warning. When you're ready, the time is yours. 
Good evening. At the last meeting in September, when this planning committee considered this application, the Parish Council raised objections due to the dangerous access and loss of the best and most versatile agricultural land. This committee has been able to see the serious access problems at this site, and the Parish Council continues to emphasise its real concerns about the dangers of the narrow lane and its exit from the site due to lack of visibility, which is a risk to residents themselves and to other traffic and pedestrians on Salford Road. And since you have seen this at first hand, I will now focus on the other serious issue, which is the, the loss of agricultural land. At the September meeting, I was asked if this particular piece of land was named in the NDP. It is not. However, the NDP was made in July 2017. A commitment by SDC to climate change policies, of which surely this must be one. Policy NV6 clearly states that the development of the best and most versatile agricultural land will not normally be supported unless it can be demonstrated that development is necessary and no other land of a poorer agricultural quality is available. This is clearly not the case in this instance. The policy further states that our best agricultural land should be protected to maintain the rural surroundings of our villages and to ensure it continues to contribute to production of food. Whereas it will be argued that the land is currently not in cultivation, it nonetheless still is agricultural land. If you grant permission for this development, this land can, be cultivate, can no longer be cultivated to produce food and will be lost forever and not replaced. The Parish Council strongly believes that the current global situation clearly shows the importance of ensuring our green and pleasant land remains, that good agricultural land should be protected and not built on. After all, it's not as if Bidford-on-Avon has not grown in the last five years, during which approximately 800 dwellings have been built. In view of this, the Parish Council would ask you to consider very carefully the damage the loss of prime agricultural land will have compared to granting permission for three more dwellings to be built in its stead. Thank you. So, Lewis, that's well within your time. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions, members? Councillor Cargill. Thank you. Um, in your NDP, you show the um, land in question within the, uh, the BUAB. Can you clarify that, please? You mean it's inside the, the built-up area? Well, yes, it is, because you, <laughs> so many other buildings have been already built on agricultural land. Yeah, the point I was getting at was that is there for, in your NDP, permission in principle, because it's within, or development in principle, within the built-up area boundary shown in the NDP? No, because it, in the NDP it says we will protect the agricultural land, even if it is within the, the built-up area. Any other questions, members? No? Ms. Adelis, thank you very much for your time and contribution this evening. Okay, our next speaker on this item is Councillor Fleming. No, I'm afraid not. <laughs> Councillor Fleming, while you're getting yourself settled, I'll just remind you, you'll have five minutes. I'll give you a 30 second warning. But otherwise, once you're settled and ready to go, you're, the floor is yours. Um. <clears throat> I visited this site today and I still object to this development for some or all of the following reasons. The access width, the minimum width allowable showed on the drawings is 3.8 metres. I physically checked it today with a tape measure. At the narrowest point it's 3.44 metres. Now bearing in mind that uh, our um, Warwickshire Fire and Rescue Service require 3.65 metres uh, to service a development. This is 250 mil short of what it's supposed to be. The development's against our NDP. We've just had a couple of questions about that. Um, and they don't, they don't come anywhere near our, uh, our housing needs survey. The ingress and egress is a contrived solution, uh, the way it's shown on these drawings. There's a couple of things not quite right about it as well. To the, uh, to, on the outward bound side of the village, uh, there's a bus shelter. In the mornings, there's between 30 and 45 kids wait at that bus stop. So if you're trying to pull out of that driveway, you can't see up the road. 
Um, and they're there obviously in the afternoon when they've been dropped off. That's that usually happens between 10 to 8 and 8.30 in the mornings. And the other thing as well is with 11 parking spaces on this site, that's an estimated potential 30 vehicle movements a day coming in and out of that driveway. Um, <clears throat> footpath is the chosen route for crossing to the Avon estate. Uh, you know, 150 homes where mothers from dropping their kids at primary school walk along the front of that. We need some clarification on traffic management because of the way this driveway is going to be constructed. Um, you could have two, way, two vehicles, two ways at the entrance area. House number 24, which is next door, if they want to come out of their driveway, it means they're going to be meeting an oncoming car coming in the other way to go into this development. So now that they've made it two ways that you can have an outbound and an inbound, the cars from number 24 are going to have to traverse the path to come down the right hand side to ex the left hand side, sorry, to come out. So I think that that's a that, that's a bit of a problem as well because it means that vehicles won't be just crossing the footpath; they'll be traversing the footpath as well. So I think that that needs to be a that needs to be investigated uh, in the supplementary guide, the manual for streets. The extra splay. The developer has signed a B certification that it doesn't own the land to widen the splay. So this is subject to a final agreement with number one Harbour Close. They don't own that piece of property where they're going to extend that driveway. The other thing as well with that is where it shows the bin housing uh, to, to, to hold bins on, on bin day, they totally ignored the fact that there's a telegraph pole in the middle of that piece of that, that width. Um, the uh, the, the telegraph pole is only 1.6 metres away from the existing post. So even if they splay it back behind the telegraph pole, you've then got to thread the, thread the bins through. Now, with three houses every fourth week, there's, four, there's 12 bins there, usually nine, you know, nine every two weeks. So for three houses, that's a lot of bins to be sitting there anyway. And you've still got to get cars past one another because they'll be in part of that extra wide part. Um, now, the other thing as well is I'd like to bring up, I brought it up last time very briefly, but I'll bring it up again. Um, in, uh, let me quote the document because I was asked to make sure I knew what I was talking about. Part, pr part P of the refuse and recycling storage on the SPD says residents should not have to take their bin waste and recycling more than 30 metres to a bin storage area or take their waste receptacles more than 25 metres to a collection point. That track is 70 metres long. So that's well in excess of what's expected. And the other thing as well, uh, from what we understand of how it's going to be constructed, um, the distance greater than 30 metres shouldn't shouldn't be a problem, shouldn't be taken on, especially if the residents have to pull these bins over rumble strips, gravel paths or steps. It's seconds. going to be a gravel track. It's going to be a gravel track. So, like I say, I'll, I'll sum this up in, in the nine points I said last time. Loss of the land amenity, the egress, visibility splay, the bend in the lane, which doesn't show up on the drawing. The width is wrong. It's not 3.8 metres, it's 3.4. The bin storage problem and moving bins down there every, every time it's bin day. Housing needs survey says no, and our NDP says no. So that's about as much as I can say. Councillor Fleming, thank you very much. Members, do we have any questions for our ward member, please? Councillor Crump. Hello, Councillor Fleming. Um, very quickly, um, you mentioned that uh, as part of your nine points in, in the representation, uh, loss of agricultural land. Yeah. Um, when was it last used? Is it still in use? And what was it used for, please? <laughs> Um, 
We didn't. I don't think your mic actually clicked on there. You've oh. said your your piece. I'm not going to ask you to repeat okay, it. We've no all heard it. And the public have heard it. So can we just make sure the mics do go red? Otherwise, they can't be picked up. Um, Councillor Cargill, next, please. Thank you. Um, right. Just on the items that uh, you mentioned there, the nine items. Could you just clarify? It says it's not a requirement development in our local heaves needs housing survey. When was that last completed, please? We, it was done in 2017, it's just due for review now. Okay, thank you. Did I see a handover on this side, Councillor Curtis? Thanks, Chair. Um, yes, Councillor Fleming, um, you mentioned um, the width of the driveway being 3.4 metres. You also mentioned the width required by the emergency services for access. I didn't quite manage to make note of that. Could you just clarify? Yeah, the minimum requirement for uh, Warwickshire Fire and Rescue is 3.65 metres. So it's 200 and odd millimetres yeah. short of that. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Any other questions for our ward member? No, Councillor Fleming, thank you very much for your time and contribution this evening. OK, that's all our speakers done. So, points of clarification to our officers. Councillor Adam first, please. Um, I believe part of the reason for uh, deferring it previously was to try and get highways to come out to the site visit. Um, I'm, I know I wasn't able to make it. Were highways from the county able to make it? Um, regrettably, no. There was no. It was myself as planning officer was on site today uh, as the point of contact for clarifying questions on matters of highways and other matters. But no, there was no county representative there this afternoon. Councillor Kendall. Thank you. Can we get a bit more detail on the uh, width of the? Of the, of the uh, path, because <clears throat> obviously we've had we've got two different versions of that. Certainly, thank you, Councillor, uh, for the for the opportunity. Um, we as officers can go by scale plans that are submitted to us for assessment. Um, there is a plan on your screen now which shows um, that the width of the proposed access points were members minor to approve that would be 3.8 meters at the point here. On the blue line plan that extends to um i've got all the figures here actually in case you can't see it it's four point um four point eight meters at the point of the gate there <clears throat> excuse me um 10 meters there at the widest point of the bell mouth there that incorporates the bin collection points <clears throat> excuse me and um, the existing access, which is proposed to be widened. Um, so 3.8 metres, it is what has been proposed for the... Councillor Parry. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> just for clarification, just for everyone here, um, I'm right in assuming, obviously, that you don't have to own the land to submit an, a planning application and therefore whilst the vis visibility displays cut across um, neighbouring properties on either side it is irrelevant that any permission has been sought or negotiation at this particular stage because when I visited the site on Monday I noticed particularly on the right hand side we have a brick wall and then a boarded fence on top. So it would mean removal of part of that brick wall of the neighbouring property. Could you just confirm for the basis of this meeting that that is my correct assumption? Thank you, Councillor. Uh, yes, you're absolutely right. The applicant has been very upfront with this. They've signed Certificate B on the application form to declare that they don't own all of the application site. They have told us in signing that certificate that they have served notice on the occupiers of number one. Um, were members minded to approve a planning application? It is for the applicant then to be able to successfully in implement that planning permission. But members this evening, um, officers are satisfied that all of that has been done correctly. Um, yes, thank you. Councillor Rolf, please. Uh, thank you. And following on from Councillor Parry's question, um, <coughs> if um, if the applicant uh, uh, wasn't to get that piece of land, then um, the egress and access would be narrower, and therefore is it contravening what the highways have asked for? to make it a safe access and egress? 
Thank you, Councillor. Um, were members minded to grant, the applicant would be compelled to implement this plan permission in full accordance with the plans of which the one on your screen is there. Um, they would not be able to implement a access that was narrower than the one that's on your screen in front of you. Um, so if the hypothetical situation you, you, you laid out there, if the applicant could not, for whatever reason, secure that, they would be unable to implement this plan permission lawfully. Just to follow on from that, if I may, um, uh, if committee were minded to grant, would it be sensible or appropriate for us to put a condition on that says that that uh, entry and egress would be completed prior to developing the main part of the land? Um, yes, that is within your gift as members this evening, um, if you uh, so wish. Um, I would say the officer's report has considered clearly, amongst other matters, is it's considered the highways access arrangements. Um, the officer has incorporated three suggested highways conditions that have been put forward by the county. Um, again, were members minded to approve uh, this, uh, this scheme? Covered, I, I believe. I've just, I've just realised, and forgive me because I missed this earlier, That's but okay. condition eight says exactly what I think I want it to say. Right. So ignore my last comment. We'll move to uh, Councillor Adam was next on my list. Uh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> Councillor Fleming was quite right. There is a sort of telegraph pole right where they are proposing to put the new entrance, uh, at least based on you know, the images that I'm looking at. Um, are the presumably power company not consultees and would they not have to be able to what I'm not totally familiar with the, the logistics of that and how that may be an impediment to construction or, or whether it's relevant as planning, material planning grounds? Yes, thank you, Councillor. The, the, it is, uh, I have looked at the submitted layout plans again, looked at the existing uh, layout plan. The telegraph pole is shown to be outside of the red line boundary. Um, however, it is directly in front of the red line boundary, as you can see here. Um, there is a telegraph pole that is shown on the existing layout plan. Um, it is my understanding that would presumably be in highways ownership, I believe. I'm not 1000% sure of that, but it's not within the red line boundary. Um, and in terms of have a has a power company been consulted on this application? The answer is no. Um, if there are matters relating to um, development nearby a telegraph pole, that is potentially a civil matter that could be uh, looked at between the applicant and the power distribution network. Um, that would not prohibit members from granting permission, again, if you were so minded. OK, next on my list is Councillor Harvey. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, I note uh, the, the question of the um, adequacy of the access, the, the, um, the, the distance between one place and another is clearly contentious. I'm, I'm concerned that there is no response from the Warwickshire Fire and Rescue Service. Do you, question one, do you share that concern? Um, secondly, could you confirm the purple area on the diagram is sufficient space for nine bins or whatever number of bins actually uh, might be? Is that an adequate space? Um, thank you, Councillor. Um, the first thing I would offer from a sort of professional view is that it's regrettable that County Fire and Rescue have not replied. Um, officer did consult and invite them to make a comment on this application. Um, it's not entirely uncommon that we, we we don't receive a comment when when we invite a consultee to, to offer one. Um, that would be my personal view, given matters of fire and rescue have been quoted um, in, in, in discussion of this application. In answer to your second question, um, officers are satisfied that, as is displayed on your screens here with my cursor there, officers are satisfied that there would be provision suitably next to this area of purple. Um, so this area where my cursor is here to the right of the purple area would be used for bin collection purposes, um, I believe every three weeks for collection. Thank you. Thank you. And presumably, rather than every three weeks, it will be on the usual rotor through Bifford. Yes, that's my understanding. Councillor Curtis, next please. Thank you. Um, just a couple of points. Um, just to be absolutely clear, there is no separate footpath on this access, is there? Uh, no, it's no. just a vehicle access it point. Um, yes. And but also, I'm, I'm, can you give some clarification on on the difference in width that we see on the plan, which I think you said is 3.8 meters, and the information 
that the ward member has given us, where it's 3.4 metres. Can you explain the discrepancy between those two? Um, I, I can offer a view, whether I can fully give you a full explanation that remains to be seen, but I can only express something I mentioned earlier. We have scaled plans showing that the access, proposed access is 3.8 metres at its narrowest point. Um, I am aware um, Councillor Fleming uh, measured the, the access this afternoon when I was present at the member site visit. Um, I can't corroborate that figure that, that, that's been quoted. Um, what I can corroborate are the figures that we've been um, informed and measured and officers have measured the off the plans. But the, yes, the, they've been measured off the plans rather than actually on site. Correct. Though. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. So just to, again, to follow on from that, presumably in the same way as the uh, this little purple section, if that 3.8 is not achievable, then the development can't go ahead. Or there would need to be some civil agreement to make sure that it can be achieved, presumably. The <coughs> were members minded to approve, the applicant would be compelled to implement this access in full accordance with the plans that have been put before us as officers and you as members this evening. That's probably the most I can say on that, I would say, Councillor. OK, fair enough. Sorry, I'll put you under pressure there. Uh, Councillor Dixon, please. Thank you, Chairman. If I hear, cast my mind back to, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago, there was a time when if you could actually develop three properties was the absolute maximum to come off a single access. Things might have changed a bit, but I just wondered, whilst it would be to be able to get to a property, uh, are the fire service able to do they insist on being able to get the vehicle through there to the houses or would they be able to operate from the road? Um, there are instances where, uh, I, I, I'm not necessarily posting this for this application, there are instances from a more general point of view where there is a condition proposed where there would be the installation of things like fire hydrants and other things of that nature. If, if it were deemed to be that there was a uh, Sassary objection whereby the Fire and Rescue Authority replied and said there is an objection that we cannot um, achieve uh, emergency services access. That's not something that we have on this application, I hasten to add. We, regrettably, as I mentioned to, uh, to Councillor earlier, it's, we haven't got a response saying yay or nay. Um, there is precedent whereby on other applications they specify a minimum width. Uh, I think Councillor, uh, Councillor Fleming mentioned it, um, 3.7 metres is what is quoted to us as officers, which I've had personally on other applications. As we've touched upon, the applicant has shown as scale plans that this access is 3.8. Um, while we're on that, I'll, uh, I'll ask our planning manager to come in and give their view as well. So, Alice, if you wouldn't mind, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, just to add to um, something Stuart just said, I thought it would be worth mentioning that um, fire safety is also considered by building regulations. So we obviously consult them as a bit of a, um, a, a double up, really, for, from a, a safety point of view to make sure we have covered all bases. But obviously, in the absence of a consultation response from them raising objection, we have to assume it, it's it, it's acceptable. And at building regulation stage, they can secure things such as sprinklers, for example, if they don't think that the access is, is wide enough for a tender to get down there. So th there is another step with which this can be uh, adequately sorted at the building regulation stage in the absence of a response from them to the planning application. Thank you, Alice. That's very helpful. Um, next is Councillor Cargill, please. Thank you. <coughs> the concern raised about the bus shelter and the, the queuing, etc. And yes, when I visit the site, I do accept that there is a visibility issue there. Is that um, something that you would consider to be um, so would be a problem to this application going ahead from a safety perspective. And also the officer, um, Mr. Fleming, the Councillor Fleming, sorry, mentioned about um, having to drive along the footpath. I can't quite visualise that, but is that an issue as well, please? Thank you, Councillor. Um, I've got the uh, visuals that I showed a little earlier in the presentation. That's the bus stop on your left in question. Um, Officers in reaching their recommendation of support this evening have given full consideration to matters of highways access, ingress, egress, matters of pedestrian safety, vehicle safety, both for the occupiers and for other road users. Um, we have consulted with county highways who have reviewed all details and offered no objections subject to uh, some conditions positive. Um, 
it would therefore be officer's view and my view this evening before you that the highways arrangement visibility displays included is acceptable um clearly that's for members to debate and determine uh, in your in shortly um and my apologies you asked me a second question i believe and i Drive. Thank you. I think you may have actually answered that particular one because you addressed the visibility displays. I, 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 I well, thank you. I, I believe I have, but I've, I mean, there's some other visuals uh, in the immediate vicinity whereby um, houses do cross uh, immediately. We've got a view here directly opposite the application site. There are existing houses that also cross footpaths that are currently in situ. Um, similarly, on this visual, slightly up the road, there are also instances where a vehicle would have to cross the footpath to get in and out of their drive. Thank you. Councillor Parry, please. Thank you. Um, I just wonder whether the officers just could confirm the actual length of the access from the um, point of entry right up that is that sort of 3.8 or whatever it is, the length of it, and also to advise that if, if members were minded to grant, could we stipulate um, a bound surface of that access road? Because pulling bins down a graveled drive that are heavy um, could be really quite challenging. Thank you, Councillor. Um, yes, I can give you some figures. The measurement from the uh, bottom of the site here on the red line the point of the footpath up to the gates here is 52 metres. Um, there is a further distance of approximately 75 metres to the first closest dwelling. Um, I haven't got an exact figure to go right to the very top of the site from the pavement, but suffice it to say it's in excess of that 75 figure, um, but it, a minimum of 52 metres to get to the point of the gates here. Anyone else before I chuck in a couple myself? No, just while we're on that point. So um, Councillor Fleming raised earlier about the distances, no more than 30 metres for, I think, recycling and 25 metres for waste when you're dragging your bins. You've just told us that is just demonstrably more than that. How how have you considered that this overcomes that requirement in RSPD? Thank you, Councillor. Um, officer's report on page 14 does cover uh, matters of waste and recycling. Um, it is agreed upon and accepted that this arrangement, um, I may just quote the, the, the report here actually, whilst the bin carry distance for residents would be longer than preferred, it is the most suitable arrangement for the site and is not considered to be a barrier to approval of this application. Overall, the waste management proposed is considered to be a suitable plan for bin storage and collection. Y you are correct that the 30 metres quoted um, is in our supplementary guidance. That is a guidance document that officers uh, use in, the, in their determinations. It's not hard and fast policy, it's, it's supplementary guidance. Um, officers have considered massive bin collection um, and have put the recommendation before you this evening that it is acceptable. So, so ultimately that SPD is guidance rather than policy. Correct. And therefore you have used your uh, understanding the site, etc., to determine that, that actually for this site it's okay. Yes, that's correct. Okay. If I'm sorry, Councillor, yep. to interrupt you. If I may, I, I realise Councillor Parry asked me a second question about the condition for the surface. My apologies, I, I actually miss it. Um, were members minded to grant, you can install in. Uh, can you can suggest a notwithstanding condition to say that the access drive will be in a bound surface or a hard standing surface? Um, were you minded to grant? Um, we heard from um, Sagalus about the agricultural lands. Now, I, when we went to the site, a lot of it, the site that, uh, that I saw was overgrown br brambles and all sorts of stuff, and then these buildings. Are we actually losing, is the agricultural land around it, or is that the other side of the application fence? <laughs> This application site and the surrounding area is in agricultural use. Um, so the red line boundary before you this evening is agricultural land. There are agricultural barns on site. Um, some of you have seen the condition of the site. Uh, you've just touched upon it yourself and there's some photos to show you. Um, officer also considers this on page 12 of, their, of the agenda packs. Um, 
it is not considered it's been a number of years since this site was last in agricultural use um officer quotes that the land um, has not been used for crop for many years and it's unlikely to be suitable to return to active agricultural use um and it is also noted that the area is very small by modern agricultural land standards so officers are of a view that this would unlikely be able to be brought back into agricultural use understood thank you uh, the driveway does it have any lights on it um, I don't think it does. It does not, not that I can see, no. Okay, that's my list. Anyone else before we move into debate? Let's open up the debate then. Who would like to kick us off first? I'm going to start pointing fingers if no one does. Councillor Rolf, please. Uh, yes. Um, so, Stuart, did you, you were on the site visit today, were you? Yes. Yeah. So, I, I just wondered um, were you able to? confirm or not confirm the width of that access or do you rely on your your the you know the paperwork uh are you happy for me to, to film yeah yeah uh thank you uh, thank you councillor um i i was present on site um i did not personally measure that distance myself um officers as, as i've touched upon can only be guided by the scale plans that we've got to assess um we, we have a distance of 3.8 metres on the scale plans, and that's what officers have used for their assessment. If I may do a follow up, I mean, because you hadn't heard back from um, from highways, from the, um, the emergency services, the emergency services uh, I, I just wondered whether you thought it might be pertinent to actually double check because you hadn't heard back from them. Um, Officer has invited them for comment that unfortunately they did not reply. Um, okay. I am here in a guise this evening to present this item on behalf of a colleague. Uh, officers um, have put their case forward in the report um, and suffice to say we don't have a county response, I'm afraid. Um, we, we had moved to debate, but we've gone backwards a touch for that uh, uh, points of clarification. Um, let's move to debate now, given Councillor Rolf uh, went backwards would you like to kick us off in the debate if i'm putting you under too much pressure you can say no i'd like you to start us off in the debate okay uh yes well why not because i've been very new to this um uh, i've got to admit i have concerns about the um uh the emergency service and the access and i have concern about the access and egress and i have concern also um, about uh, ensuring that there is a condition on the surface of that access uh, simply because uh, there is nothing worse than the noise of dragging bins down the side of that house of number 24. So that's my start to the debate. Thank you very much. Councillor Parry, please. Thank you, Chair. I think what we have in front of us is really quite... Um, it is... Uh, the reason it was deferred was obviously that we wanted to go and have a look at the access. Um, it is, it has got um, a lot of challenges, um, but on the face of it, we have to look in terms um, of grant or refusal for material planning reasons. And obviously the main issue we have here is the access into the site. And we have um, a no objection from highways, Warwickshire County Council. We also have um, the positioning for proposed waste and bins. And whilst the applicant doesn't own the necessary land to create the visibility splay, um, that, is, that is not a material consideration. But we also have guidelines in terms of the recommended um, distance for bin collection. So on the surface of it, I'm struggling to find a solid material planning reason to refuse on the basis this, that this would be very significantly conditioned to um, ensure that all the appropriate um, displays and visibility was overcome. So on that basis, um, whilst I don't like what I have in front of me, I have to go on material planning reasons. The site is within the um, 
BUAB or that, that has been recently updated. Um, the other consideration we have to think about is the other neighbouring properties all access that main Salford road. Um, there is a very wide area in front of the immediate narrowing gateway at the moment where cars can pull off and I actually parked right uh, and my car was off the main highway so there was certainly plenty of room for a car to pause there and actually another car pass. So on that basis I'm being forced to propose recommendation of grant with the condition that we have a bound surface up the track um, because I can't, because we've got no objection from Warwickshire Highways, I c don't have a material planning reason to refuse, Chair. Thank you very much. Councillor Cargill, please. Thank you. Oh, very interesting. Uh, we have a 10 year housing land supply. There's no local need identified. So it's an open market development. <coughs> the NDP shows it the site within the BOAB, but it says that they should protect um, agricultural land. And I fully agree that we don't, we're not growing land anymore. There is damage to the wall, but I think in the grand scheme of things, that's relatively minor. And unfortunately, I go with Councillor Parry. I can't find any material planning reasons to object to this. Just to confirm, are you seconding Councillor Parry's proposal? Yes. Thank you very much. Councillor Curtis, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, sorry, this is something I'm, perhaps I should have asked for clarification on, but I'm, I'm still concerned about this discrepancy in the widths. And there have been other instances um, that have come before various committees where there has been some concern over the accuracy of scale, using scale plans. And I'm just wondering if emergency services, the emergency services haven't responded, but if the emergency services were given a width of 3.8 metres, then they would consider that there was reasonable access. If they were given a width that was the 3.4 metres, then they may well come back and respond. So I'm, I, I am concerned that there is this apparent discrepancy. If it is 3.8, then, then I would remove that, that, that concern. But I do have a, a, a bit of a, an issue about that. Um, and I, again, if we were minded, if the committee were minded to grant, um, agree with comments made by Councillor Parry and, and Rolf, I think, about having a bound surface, not only um, for um, in, uh, the removal of, removal of bins, sorry, the movement of bins, but also um, anybody using a wheelchair, push chairs, which would be extremely difficult over a non-bound surface. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Councillor Kendall, next, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I think everything I wanted to say has largely been said, so I won't go over all ground. I, in terms of the widths and the access, I think I'm right in saying if, if something was wrong, then the, applica then the application uh, permission would be withdrawn later on. If something was found to not be correct, then that, that would fall at that stage. So I'm, I'm going to go with the officer's judgment on this one, um, because I think that's good enough. And, and in terms of finding any other app, um, material planning grounds, as it's all been said, I can't see any strong planning grounds, so I would have seconded if I had, if I'd had the opportunity. Sorry about that. Uh, Councillor Adam next, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I, I do agree that I can't find any material grounds to um, go against the officer's recommendation as a proposal, but I, I won't be supporting it because I think that from my point of view, it's almost been over-engineered to try and get a technicality through our planning system. And I think the reality of that is we're being forced to consider something which may indeed be completely impractical to build. And that in reality, that what will be built won't be able to go conform to these plans and they'll probably try and build it anyway. That may be a cynical view um, and that's my personal view and so be it. But that's, uh, I feel that as I'm going to vote against it, I'm, I have to explain that reason. But like I say, um, I think the technicalities of it that our officers have correctly assessed uh, meet, our, meet our guidance and so that, that's probably the reason why uh, we can't find any material grounds to go against them. So that's my view on it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Adam. Councillor Rolfe, please. Uh, yes, so how much um, credence can we give to the neighbourhood development plan, um, i.e. Uh, is it a material planning reason if it, this piece of land is not identified in their plan? 
Um, it is a made plan and therefore holds material weight in the planning balance. Sorry, can you say that again? It is a made plan and therefore holds material weight in the planning balance. So if I may follow up, yep. so it can be a planning reason to object that it is not part of the plan. Is, am, am I, is, is that correct? You can, you can, by all means, you can put that forward, but I don't think it's sufficient to overcome. Um, I will ask our officers to respond directly, but I don't think it's appropriate to use that. Thank you for the opportunity, Councillor. Uh, thank you, Councillor, as well. The, the, the Bidford Neighbour Development Plan has full significant weight. It is part of the development plan that officers have used to assess this, this application against. Officer has quoted NDP policies, uh, which officers believe this proposal is in accordance of. Um, the development plan has been given full assessment and it's officers' opinion that this development is in accordance with that plan. Um, and that's where officers have arrived at. Councillor Crump. Uh, yeah, I just thought I'd come in um, to talk on this also um, and explain that I'm chair of um, portfolio holder for fire and rescue at the county. Um, obviously, there is a fire station just up the road, well, relatively up the road in, in Bidford, um, so they will know the area well. And also, fire and rescue do have different size vehicles. Um, what they do is resource to risk. There's a community risk management plan that's been out for consultation recently, and that's based on risk. And the, the, the motto is prevention, protection, response. So there is all about risk regarding that. So I just thought I'd make that clear. Um, so if that helps, I know, I don't know why they haven't responded, but I do know that throughout the summer they had a really particularly challenging time amongst all that heat and now since that heat's gone they've got loads of water everywhere so they are under a lot of pressure at the moment but I, I don't know the reasons why they haven't responded and I will try and find out so just to make that clear. Going back to the application I hope that, that was helpful chairman um, I'll just then come in we do need I think it's difficult to refuse this on strong planning grounds. And therefore, I think we do need to have strong and robust conditions, particularly around the hard standing, particularly around the bins. I do have some concerns about this in our policies and guidance, and whether we do some um, equality, um, EI, I can't remember what it stands for now, equality impact assessment, there yeah, it's just come, around these. And, and if we do want people to live here, but I suppose, if people are aware of the drive uh, before they buy it, um, so they're not being forced. But there is that condition. But I think we do need um, strong conditions around the hard standing. And going back to Councillor Adams' uh, point about a technicality and not build it to like that, I don't think that is strong enough as a planning re reason to refuse this application. Yeah, I can understand where it's come from and, and in principle, but again, I. I yeah, and if we if we refused it using that type of words, I think it would go to appeal and we'd lose. So that's just my ten pennies. I hope it was helpful. Thank you. Councillor Dixon, please. I'll try and be brief. Um, listening to the parish council, they had two concerns, I thought. One was the use of agricultural land. I don't think this has been agricultural land for a while. It may have old barns on it, but like the officers, I do not anticipate this coming back into food production of any type uh, in any uh, decade shortly. Uh, when it comes to the visibility displays, yes, there is a bus shelter. But the crowds there with the school children and the rest of it is momentary and therefore I will be supporting the officer's recommendation. Thank you very much. Anyone else before I just very briefly sum up? Um, uh, so I think I agree with most of what's been said, both in terms of um, the proposal, but also some of the concerns that have been raised, specifically the concerns that I think are most prominent are the width of the access. Um, our officer has very kindly helped us at least twice, if not three times, about the, the uh, what we're looking at. We did measure on site. I was on the site visit and, and we did measure on site the width. Um, I'm not for one second suggesting that Councillor Fleming's uh, take measure had been adjusted in any way, but of course it was Councillor Fleming's take measure. Um, so just to be uh, mindful of that. Um, the reality is that the drawings do say 8.3 metres throughout that, that width. They also say that they're going to widen the front. Pardon? Sorry, three plan. <laughs> 
<laughs> people at uh, plot one and two are suddenly panicking, thinking they're going to lose some garden there. Sorry about that. 3.8. Um, that is what has been put in the drawings. That is what is clearly indicated by the drawings. And we have conditions that say this must be built out in accordance with those drawings. So they must meet that eight, uh, that 3.8, almost did it again, 3.8. Now, um, so I'm, I will be going with the recommendation and, and the pros that have been put, including that uh, the bonded surface. What I would, I wonder whether it's worth uh, expanding on um, condition eight, which currently says access widen as per plans prior to commencement of the development to full length of access widening to make sure that we do meet and then that way we have our officers and then able to say yes this has met i'm going to assume you're comfortable with that yes is the answer i'm looking for. <laughs> um the the access to be yes the access to be widened as per the plans yes the full length so it's access widen and the full length of the driveway i want because it says say 8.3 uh, 3.8 does say 3.8 on there. We know it has to be built out in accordance with the plans. Mm -hmm. I see no reason why we can't include that because it's not onerous. It is what is in the plans. And I just want to be absolutely clear that that is done before building work starts. Because what I don't want to see is the building work to be done and then find that the access can't be, uh, uh, sorry, the access and the length of the drive can't be uh, put right. Yes, that can be accommodated. Okay, so as our proposal in a second, so Councillor Parry, are you happy with that inclusion? Councillor Cargill, are you happy with that? Lovely, that's two yeses. So. I'm happy with that. The proposal is to grant with the addition of the bonded surface condition and the extension of the uh, the driveway width condition. Could I please have a show of hands for those in favour of granting? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine. And those against? Two and uh, one, sorry, and one. abstentions? One. one. So committee therefore resolves to grant application 2201071FUL in line with the officer recommendation and with the addition of those two uh, conditions. That's fine. Okay, we. Okay. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's move on to our next item of the evening. Um, uh, the application reference is 2200001 FUL, that is land near to Middle Road Farm in uh, Harbury. Our presenting officer is Joe Brook. Joe, whenever you're ready, it's over to you. Thank you, Chair. The application site is located in the open countryside with, within the parish of Harbury and Ufton, as indicated by the indicative plan before you. So as you can see, this is Ufton Parish, and there's further plans clarifying later, and this is Harbury just there. Yeah. <laughs> The application is for the installation of ground-mounted solar photo, photo panels including the construction of the comms tower to enable a rated capacity of 4.99 megawatts. It must also be noted that the solar farm, if permitted, is for temporary permission of 40, 40 years and six months. Thereafter, all equipment, buildings, associated infrastructure will be removed in a Oh, apologies. It's not me, it went off. I'll leave it. So this is the Harbury village just down there. The southern end of the application site closest to Harbury village and the northern end of the application site close there. You can see Ufton Parish. I should also highlight that this is a grade two listed building 
The Roman settlement is located within this vicinity down here. And this area is also a solar farm called Radford Simile Solar Farm. So this is the southern end of the site closest to Harbury. Now, as you can see, the substation site access telecom containers and all sort of main buildings will be located within this area. This is the FOSS leading up that area and this is where it will be located within this section if permitted. This is a 15 meter tower that is proposed for the development. I'll quickly go back to the other plan so you can see it would be located within this vicinity if permitted. And then this is the northern end of the site closer to Ufton. The panels, which will obviously form the majority of the site, will be arranged on metal frames pushed into the ground. They are to be finished in non-reflective dark colour to maximise absorption and will extend to 3.1 at the highest point and 1.1 metres at their lowest. The arrays will be mounted on a single axis tracker mounting structure, which will be constructed from simple metal framework mounted on piles that will be driven to the ground, thus avoiding the need for substantive foundations. The panels will track the movement of the sun throughout the day they will be laid in north and south rows with spacing between each row to allow maintenance as well as seat grazing to avoid shading. So come to the site photographs. This was taken on this area here, as you can see, indicate. This is where the solar panels would be um, developed or installed if permitted. This is looking up, so none of this area would actually be part of the solar panels things, but as you can see, it's relevant because this is often and they would be looking down, so I'll flip back. That's what they will be reviewing over. That's the edge of Ufton and the dwellings coming down. This is taken from the LVIA, but I've included it because it gives you a good indication of the areas. So this would be the application site north of the field as taken, as you can see in the northern corner there, looking inwards. This is the Radford simile um, solar farm at the minute, and you see that's how it's located and how it's installed at this moment in time. This is once again taken from the LVI for obvious reasons. It gives you the details at the middle road. This is taken from Google Earth because once again it shows a better analysis of the site. So this is then taken looking into the application light from this area. So this area would be uh, solar arrays. And this is then the other section taken just off the FOSS. So once again, you can see the distinguishing features within the landscape. Let me just go back. In conclusion, in light of the Council Climate Change Emergency Declaration, the Climate Change Act, constituting the UK's legally binding commitment to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and the policy stipulations of the MPPF, consideration that this application will help reduce CO2 emissions with an annual saving of 27,188 tonnes and is calculated to provide electricity to around 14,500 homes, the application is considered to accord with the area's development plan and as such, officer recommendation is for approval. If I can draw your attention to the update sheet, there is a few. A member site visit was undertaken. Also, clarification when the officer report within the landscape section, it is stated 116 hectares. This is in reference to the agricultural land classification. The site is 89.3, as I've already stated. And also clarification on the methodology for the electrical output, as well as clarifications on how it came to the CO2 emissions. Thanks, Chair. Joe, thank you very much indeed. We will call our first speaker on this item, who is Councillor John Taylor, Chairman of Ufton Parish Council. And I believe we also have a Jackie Chapman here to answer questions. Is that right? Uh, yes, would, uh, would Mr Chapman like to come forward just in case? Hello, good evening. Would you like to come and grab yourself a seat at the front for me? You may not be called upon, but it's better to have you here than not. So, Councillor Taylor, you'll have three minutes. Uh, I'll give you a 30 second warning before your time is up. And if you want to stay seated afterwards for questions, otherwise, whenever you're ready, the floor is yours.
Okay, Councillor Taylor, sorry, can you just double check your mics on? I, I don't think it's uh, being picked up. We do have some glitches with our microphone, so for everyone, I do apologise. Okay. If you wouldn't mind, what I will do is I will restart the clock and Thank whenever you you're much. ready, the microphone is now on, so you're good to go. Uh, yes, I, I represent the people of Ufton. Um, we are opposed to this, uh, this development. And I was about to say, I, I, I thank uh, Mr. Brooks for actually mentioning Ufton. Um, when we first received the public consultation about this, Ufton isn't actually mentioned. It's entitled land at Middle Road Farm. Uh, often is mentioned once simply for positioning it as on the north of the site on the A425. Later on, uh, I received this one. La planning site notice, land near to Middle Road Farm, Middle Road Harbury. When I received it, somebody had written in pencil here and often, and would you believe that before this meeting started today, I've got another report. Uh, land near to Middle Road Farm, Middle Road, Harbury. Um, I, I would like to reassure you, reassure you all, often does actually exist. Uh, we're a tiny community of approximately 200 people. Uh, you have received uh, I believe 27 objections from this small community to this site, plus unanimity from the council to from the parish council to support it. I know I'm being satirical, but one of the prisoners said to me, "Are they trying to pull the wool over our eyes about over our eyes about this?" Okay, um, I, I admit I've vented a bit of spleen there, um, but I do represent our parish. Let's stand back and have a look at what this actually is um, from that uh, two-dimensional plan. This is what it is. Let's assume that you good people are from Harbury. You're very lucky by the way, it's a nice village. And you unfortunate people live in Ufton. In between the two parcels of land, which this application really is, it's approximately two kilometers of land, as you can see on that diagram there, which isn't part of this application. 30 seconds. Sorry? 30 seconds. Thank you. Okay. Council Adam will speak next and focus on the landscaping. I would just like to say that we are on board with, with solar. If I lived in Harbury, I would be very happy with that proposal. It's in the right place. We know that Harbury supports the application. You are hearing that we don't. I know... Councillor Taylor, I'm going to have to ask you to wrap up. You have yes. exceeded your three minutes now, so you've got okay. 10 seconds to wrap up. I know you can't approve half an application, but may I respectfully ask that you consider rejecting the application in its totality and inviting the applicant to come back to you with a proposal for the Harbury site. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Councillor. I have given you an extra 15 seconds. I am now required to provide that extra time to both the applicant and to our ward member, just so you, you are aware. I'm sorry if I overstepped. That's quite all right. Um, members, do we have any questions? Councillor Parry first. Hello, good evening, Councillor. Um, on the basis of your presentation, um, would I, could, you, could you advise if the applicant made any communication with Ufton Parish Council um, to explain, to consult with you about what they were planning to do? There has been no consultation from the applicant apart from this document of nearly two years ago. Am I right? Oh, they've made one telephone call to the parish clerk. OK, anyone else have a question for our speakers? No, in that case, Councillor Taylor, Ms Chapman, thank you very much for your time and contribution this evening. Thank you. And we will call forward our next speaker on the item, who is a Ms Annabel Roberts. And I believe we have a Mr Harry Wilder here to answer questions as well. So if I can invite you both forward.
Hello and good evening. I think you've got a good idea of the drill now. You're going to have three minutes and 15 seconds. I will give you a 30 second warning before your time is up. It looks like your microphone is already on. So whenever you're ready, feel free to start. Good evening. My name is Annabelle Roberts and I'm here representing the applicant for the proposed solar farm and speak in support of the application. Leicestershire Solar One is a subsidiary of Canadian Solar, an international leader in renewable energy generation who together with Novagy are the developers. In 2019, Stratford District Council declared a climate emergency. Such action highlights the necessary changes to adapt to the effects of climate change, which can no longer be ignored. Noting this summer was England's joint warmest on record since 1884. This application will help to significantly tackle these issues through increasing renewable energy generation and reducing carbon emissions, where over 27,000 tonnes of carbon will be saved annually. The proposal will produce enough clean renewable electricity to power 14,500 homes, cutting harmful greenhouse gas emissions. The application will help to meet national commitments and obligations set out by the government in its net zero strategy. It will also make a valuable contribution towards addressing the current energy crisis we're in while providing energy security in the long term. The site has been carefully selected and lies outside of any statutory environmental planning and landscape designations and allows for a viable in-field connection to the electricity network. The vast majority of the land is subgrade 3B and is therefore not best and most versatile land. In addition to the generation of renewable energy, ecological benefits which accord with core strategy policy CS6 include a biodiversity net gain of over 30%, a dedicated ecological enhancement area with wildflower meadows and boundary wildflower seeding, as well as tree and woodland understory planting to improve visual screening of the site. Since submission, we have engaged with officers and provided further details to address queries raised by Warwickshire County Council Highways, Network Rail and BE Landscaping Design on behalf of the Council, and none of these consultees raised an objection. The applicant also decided to remove panels from the field closest to Westfield Cottages and an updated site layout and landscape mitigation plan was provided. The landscape effects of the scheme have been independently reviewed by BEA who raised no objection to the assessment or the cumulative impact of the development. The proposed landscape planting across the site will reinforce the green infrastructure network in line with policy CS7. The application will ensure the viability of the farm and its continued agricultural operations for food production alongside the production of green energy. Existing grazing land, which makes up a large proportion of the site, will remain as sheep farming. The arable land will be converted for grazing, reducing the need for fertilisers and chemical sprays while allowing biodiversity to thrive. Developing this site for renewable energy has been demonstrated to be acceptable and in accordance with policies of the core strategy, in particular policy CS3 sustainable energy, as well as the national planning policy framework. 30 seconds. As you are aware, officers have recommended approval after carefully weighing up the balance of planning considerations. I therefore respectfully request members to grant planning permission in accordance with your officer's recommendation. Thank you. Mr. Roberts, thank you very much indeed. Members, do we have any questions? Councillor Cargill first, please. OK, Councillor Rolfe, thank you. Very gracious of you. Um, uh, thank you. Um, the previous speaker mentioned that uh, the applicant hadn't uh, been in any discussions with Ufton Parish Council. Could you tell me why that? Uh, why you didn't? Yeah, I believe that to be um, incorrect. I know that there were conversations. There was a phone call that, um, and a couple of phone calls. And I think contact was made. Um, I actually have um, our applicant here with us, our de developer. So Harry might be able to say a little bit more about that. Would you like me to? If you turn your microphone on, you certainly can. Thank you very much. Um, yes, so I have personally reached out to both Harbury and Ufton's parish clerks. And I've spoken, I had one very long conversation with Ufton's parish clerk, who's here this evening. I have called on several other occasions, but re been reached by the voicemail. I have left voicemail and was instructed that they needed to speak to each other about exactly what they wanted in terms of the community benefit that we're proposing. Any criticism or comment that they would have had would have been taken into consideration. Unfortunately, we can only engage with people who want to engage with us. Thank you very much. Councillor Cargill, please. Thank you. You mentioned community engagement. Um, you're offering, I believe, correct in saying, a certain sum of money for this, whereas other suppliers of solar farms have offered a more generous, i.e. 10% of the energy after a period of time uh, that goes back into the local community. Is that not something that you would care to offer? 
So community benefit and the contributions that different projects make are a difficult thing to view in a like by like basis in our industry. A lot of the larger, more generous contributions that were made were made in the days of subsidy. As we all know here today that solar doesn't get a subsidy anymore. And that means we can only afford to offer what, we, what we're giving, which is £50,000. And that will be divided amongst several organisations, some of whom we've identified during the consultation. But we're also happy to leave that open until energisation when the payment will be made. If you have any examples of these sites that are being that generous, I would be interested to see them because I don't think that would certainly wouldn't stack up for us, unfortunately. May I, Chairman? Um, well, Drayton, just up the road from us, uh, I did that the first time. Um, that was a 50 megawatt as well, or 49.9, because I know it comes under the boundary. Um, right, the second item um, you mentioned about biodiversity and all those good things, um, and also the fact that it is possible, there's lots of cans and ifs and buts, but possible for animals to roam under the panels. For uh, But I've also heard from other developers that they don't allow animals in because of potential damage to the actual um, solar panels. So in this case, will animals be allowed to roam and graze underneath the panels? When you say animals, are you meaning sheep grazing the site or that um, mammals can come through free? Rabbits, but I'm <laughs> Not rabbits, sheep. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the land holding at the moment is, you know, a, a large majority of it is for sheep grazing and that activity is going to continue. Uh, and you know, Some people can be cynical about that. So I'll show you a solar farm where there's sheep grazing and I can name a few in, in Gloucestershire, you know, where we're from. But actually it's a benefit. It's, it saves the developer, um, you know, having to mow and pay for maintenance that the sheep do it for free. So it's actually, you know, it, it does serve them well rather than just, you know, saying something for PR. But it will be, you know, it, it will have that dual function for energy use and and for sheep grazing, for sheep rearing, which will continue the food production of the site. Thank you very much. I'm just going to remind members and everyone else that we, we we are tight for time. We've got a lot to get through tonight. So if we could please keep our questions concise and pointed, and any points we want to make concise as well, that'd be helpful. Councillor Crump, please. The good news is, Mr. Chairman, uh, Councillor Cargill asked my question. That's good. That is concise. I'm happy with that. Councillor Dixon, next, please. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, two questions, if I may. Um, the Par Afton Parish Council thought itself that uh, one site was acceptable to them, one site was not acceptable to them. Is it a situation whereby it only becomes viable if you do both? Yes, it is. I mentioned earlier today that um, we don't receive a subsidy and the reason why the project is the size it is is because of the available capacity and the need to build a particular type of substation in order to, um, to connect. Obviously, you take that connection cost and you apportion it against the amount of megawatts you're able to install, reducing down to half simply wouldn't be viable. Thank you. And uh, I understand that the panels themselves will, as it were, follow the sun. Does that mean that they start facing east and end facing west or northeast to northwest through the south? So Canadian Solar are committed to developing the best, most technologically advanced sites that we can in the UK. Single axis trackers are a relatively new technology with only a few sites built so far in the UK, but they have been successfully deployed abroad. The principle is that instead of a fixed traditional array, which runs from east to west and faces south, the rows run from north to south and they will start the day facing to the, to the east, rotating across a single axis across the day to face west. That means that you utilize the panels to a much higher extent throughout the day. And what that does is not only does it produce more power, but it also produces more power at the start and at the end of the day, making solar a more reliable contributor to our national network. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Parry, next, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, it is normal for developers of large schemes to go and present their plans at the respective parish councils. Can you just briefly explain? Appreciate you've made some phone calls. Could you just explain why you felt it wasn't necessary to go and present your plans at a parish council meeting? So Canadian Solar with our development partner Novogy has a number of strategies that we employ throughout the UK. Obviously, during COVID, we stopped doing these, uh, the physical consultation events entirely. And for some projects, we have brought them back. In this instance, uh, the planning and development team decided that a community consultation event wasn't the way to go for this project. And instead engaged with a website with um, the 
paper leaflets that have been received to people's homes and also directly if they were contacted by concerned constituents. I have personally engaged with several members of the, uh, of the community to amend our plans as already stated. Councillor Harvey, please. Yes, thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, in order to um, advocate your case, you, did you make a calculation on the number of houses that could be powered as an equivalent? Uh, an argument against is uh, food security. Um, can you tell me if there is any impact on food security by the installation of this uh, proposal? And if so, what sort of scale of magnitude would that decrease in food security be? Um, well, we said that the um, renewable electricity provided will um, provide, provide enough uh, electricity to power 14,500 homes. The um, use of the site will continue as agriculture. It's already over half of the site, um, well over half is already grazing for sheep production. The rest is arable and that will be converted into grazing, which could be used to increase stocking densities for more food, more, you know, more sheep rearing, more lamb, um, or it could be left, um, you know, as grazing. So it, it's actually in some ways beneficial to the farmer for viability because they don't have to pay uh, for food to come in. You know, they, they can have more grazing rather than kind of paying um, for um, additional uh, food over the winter and hay, etc. Um, so I don't think it's going to make much difference. They will carry on. You know, what they're doing now is not going to change. They're going to carry on farming as sheep farmers. Councillor Curtis, please. Thank you, Chair. A um, couple of questions, if I may, just first one very quickly. Um, we've got two separate sites here. How will they be connected? Will there be overground cables, underground cables? Yeah, it will be an underground cable network that will run basically from the south of the site and it will go um, along the, um, you know, the, the Fossway um, or the verges of that and then connect back in into the northern part of the site and it, it will all be in underground connections. Great. Thank you. And my other query is on the 14,500 homes. My, I'm not a mathematician, um, but the average annual consumption per meter, domestic consumption per meter in Stratford district is 4,800 kilowatts. Um, that times 14 and a half thousand gives 69 megawatts. Um, the figures you have here of nearly 50 megawatts by that calculation um, would be enough energy for 10,200 homes. So I just wonder how, given, given that the average consumption, as I say, per metre in domestic is 4,800, um, how we arrive at the figure of 14,500? I think there are different ways of coming to that number. Um, Harry, could you advise any more how we got to that? Yeah. I appreciate what you're saying, and it's an incredibly difficult thing to um, to try and look at the numbers and work out exactly what it's going to exactly what it's going to be. Obviously, the scheme itself is a 49.9 megawatt solar farm, but that doesn't mean that that is the annual production of the site. Now, the site's production figure I don't have with me, but it is a, a figure that we model when we do the financial modellings for the site, and we then take that annual figure and then we take the the government national figure for the UK and divide that figure by that. Obviously, Stratford's figure may well be much higher than the national figure. I believe the national figure is nearer to 3,800, which, of course, we can only, and we probably as developers should, try and use national figures, not local, so that we are, otherwise we could use different figures for areas of the country that were vastly different. We need to get some continuity in the industry for how we describe our schemes, because we appreciate they are very technically complex in some ways and it is difficult to make sure that is there's is a clear message for how much energy is provided. Thank you. I just uh, I don't quite agree um, with your assertion that we should we should be looking at national figures because we are Councillor looking at I'm going to ask you to ask a question rather than debate the pros and cons of calculations. I will leave that for debate. Good man. Thank you. I would also draw everyone's attention to the update sheet, which does give a calculation of uh, the megawatt hours and the number of houses as well. Uh, does anyone else have any questions for our speakers? Um, I just want to clarify with the connection between the north site and the south site, you said it's going to be a, an underground wire connection along the Fossway. Is that correct? Or is it going to be over the fields? Yeah. 
it, it will be an underground connection from, if you just have a look at that drawing there, the southwestern corner of the northern, northern pass, you'll see the red line extends to the Foss Way. The cable will then run either in the verge or in the highway under a section 50 down to the southern site where the primary substation and point of connection onto the local distribution network is located. Lovely. Thank you very much. If there's no other questions, which I don't believe there are, thank you both very much for your time and contribution this evening. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll call our last speaker on this item, who is Councillor Adam. Councillor Adam, come on down. Now, you, of course, normally have five minutes, but we do give you an extra 15 seconds. So you've got five minutes and 15 seconds. Feel free to use as much or as little as you wish. Whenever you're comfortable and ready, the time is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, committee. Um, I say this is a very difficult application for me. Um, I do. I am actually a massive supporter of uh, solar in our district uh, and even in my ward. Um, I voted for declaring a climate emergency and I accept that this means compromises uh, have to be made. Um, we have to scrutinise the applications we see from a larger picture, um, but also from the point of view of our residents to ensure that the impact that these developments have are sensitive to and inclusive of um, the communities that we represent who ultimately have to live with them. Um, in, with that in mind, uh, we should not uh, not let the solution to our climate uh, problems also take away what we're trying to save. That's why I'm here tonight uh, to represent my residents. Uh, and I also say that I think that I don't bring this to a committee lightly. I think it's just important that we are able to scrutinise these types of very large applications in the proper way to make sure they're done properly. Um, I'll, I'll start by saying that there's a, there is actually much about this application I do support, uh, the carbon offset. Um, increase in uh, net biodiversity, uh, economic benefits um, are welcome positives. Uh, and uh, the, the community benefit fund contribution is, is appreciated. Um, I noticed that there there is positive support as well from residents, um, albeit that there, they'll be elsewhere in, um, in in the district from, from my patch, um, as well as the objections, and that Harbury Parish Council have no objections, at least to the parcel in their parish. Uh, I have no views to the contrary uh, for the southern parcel of land. However, uh, the reservations that I uh, do have can't be overlooked regarding uh, the adjacent, uh, the area adjacent to Ufton, uh, being the northern northern part of the site, the impact on land state, landscape stands to directly negatively affect the wide open landscape and Ufton residents. Uh, top, topography is extremely important in this case. Um, the parcel. Uh, the northern parcel is directly below the village of Ufton. Um, every property on the west of the village, including the pub garden, uh, the White Hart, will directly overlook the northern parcel of the site. Um, I appreciate the proposed conditions for hard and soft landscaping. However, the elevation difference between the centre of the village and the nearest field being developed is about 40 metres or 131 feet. Um, no amount of soft landscaping uh, can overcome this. I think that was mentioned earlier by the officer. Um, you will also recognise that um, the existing solar array adjacent to the Foss Way, which is um, sort of observable on, on the plan, um, is between the parcels. This is uh, positioned as, as another one uh, in, in such a way that is more secluded, um, being still visible, but a much more significant distance from Ufton and is less visible from the road. And so has a relatively small impact on the landscape, uh, which is the type of arrangement that I can uh, quite happily support. Uh, for reference, though, uh, this existing array is approximately a fifth of uh, the proposed northern pa parcel alone or thereabouts. Um, the officer states that they acknowledge that the application will cause a level of harm by urbanising the currently undeveloped agricultural fields and CS5A2 states uh, proposals should protect landscape character and avoid detrimental effects on features uh, which make significant contribution to the character, history and setting of the, the settlement um, area. It's clear from seeing it that the overlook one has from Ufton makes this land part of a valued landscape. And therefore, given the scale of development, the harm cannot reasonably be mitigated uh, in this location. Um, as has been mentioned before in this committee, if it's not right, it's wrong. Uh, I feel despite all the benefits that applies here and that more work's needed to make it right, which I would welcome. Um, I'd urge that this application is refused now so that it can be amended to exclude the 
more damaging parts of the application, uh, in which I see as the northern parcel, uh, and possibly have other nearby areas considered for solar, but will not have such a severe Im impact on the landscape and, um, and residents, allowing us to address the climate er emergency in the district whilst taking our residents with us. Councillor Adam, thank you very much. Well, within your time, members, do we have any questions for our ward member, please? Councillor Dixon, please. Thank you, Chairman. I asked the, uh, the developer um, as to the uh, orientation of the, uh, of the solar panel as such. Now, looking at my map, I think uh, the development, if it proceeds, uh, the northern part at least, will be more or less to the almost due west of Ufton. And therefore, in the early morning, those panels will be facing Ufton in the first morning of light. Uh, by lunchtime, perhaps facing away, come evening, um, facing opposite direction. Do you think that that change throughout the day will have a uh, have no improvement on the landscape um, impact? Certainly, often it is above, you're looking down on it, certainly facing when it's in the morning, you can see the panels in the evening, perhaps not. I mean, my view on sort of the visibility of it is it, it's development on the whole, and as I say, it's sort of the um, the urbanisation of the landscape is the thing that I'm more concerned about. I think there are technical aspects that which probably make it less egregious in some ways, uh, and I know that some of those are related to in the the glint and glare assessments that have been carried out. But I think it's more the development of whole fields on on the whole being such so close to the village. That's the that's the area of landscape detriment that I'm coming from more than the technicalities of, of how they affect them over the day. Councillor Cargo, please. I think I think it's been answered. Um, I, I'm happy with the answer that uh, Councillor Very Adams good. had. Anyone else have a question for our ward member? No, in that case, Councillor Adams, thank you very much indeed. Right, let's move to points of clarification. Anyone have any points of clarification for officer? Councillor Rolf. Please. Uh, yeah, I wonder if you can help me. So on page 35, um, the paragraph about moderate impact, uh, where reflections are predicted to be experienced for more than three months per year or for more than 60 minutes per day, the impact significance is moderate. Um, can, can you just elaborate on that? Is it, are you talking about, is, is this seasonal? Uh, yeah, it is seasonal. So basically, it's set out in the glint and glare assessment. Um, it might be worth showing the glint and glare assessment quickly because I've got it up. Two seconds. So as you can see under section 1.33, it shows the glint and glare assessment of it and how the 22 main dwellings say so done receptors throughout the day of all areas of the dwellings that have been located and the impact on them. Um, it's highlighted that there will be through the year some impact, but Overall, that impact is considered to be relatively negligible. Um, so, if I may, I mean, we're to, if we're talking seasonal, I mean, we've had an unseasonable season recently in the summer, where it's been incredibly hot for a lot longer than three months. And in fact, I would argue tomorrow is going to be 20 degrees, which is summer weather. So. So I, I, I'm still confused as well, you, you you pinpoint it to three months. Well, you've also got the tilt and access and all that lot. I mean, the problem being with that assessment is, yes, it's been a, a, a very hot year, but the glint and glare assessment has been undertaken by professional experts. So that glint and glare assessment is undertaken, including the whole seasonals and average every year. I can't, it's been done by professional experts at the work and also it states within the assessment, worst case scenario. I think in answer to your question, Councillor Rolf, it, it doesn't matter how warm the day is, the earth still tilts on its axis and autumn and winter and summer and spring still pr progress throughout the year. And that's the basis of the calculations that when the sun is at a certain angle to the earth, this is what will happen. That's what that, that point is making in the yeah. report. And like I said, it is worst case scenario. It's not just on the best solutions. It's worst case scenario set out in the report. Councillor Cargill, please. A couple of I may, Chair. Um, first, it says a 40-year um, temporary 
period, which is a generation actually, quite interesting, as a, as a temporary period. Uh, so not really that temporary. Um, the other solar farms have had a 25 year period. Why not? Why not this particular one? Because that's what they're proposing. It's the application for us, first thing, and it's what it's not just that. You've also got to consider the benefits over 40x amount of years. In an ideal world, hopefully in 25 years, renewable energy is at such a place these aren't required and it could be removed. But at the minute, that is 40 years where we we'll supply 14,500 homes of electricity. That's per year. Okay, thank you. The um, the other one was landscaping. Now, um, the Drayton Farm, which, if you cash your mind back, I was actually chairing that particular uh, meeting. We are we have spent a lot of time discussing landscaping. Uh, to mitigate the impact of the farm. And I don't believe any of that's actually been implemented on that, that farm, because certainly not alongside the, the A46. I'm going to ask the question, if, if the committee is minded to grant planning permission, how can we robustly enforce the planning of landscaping uh, on that site, please? <laughs> because obviously it's um, important. And finally, if I may, Chair, in the conclusion, page 33, it states the land shall be adequately restored at the end of temporary permission. Uh, is this actually enforceable or a reasonable uh, um, condition? So the first one is obviously conditions have been even proposed for it for the landscape and the harm and that lot to be submitted. You have your right as the committee to decide actually if you want to impose certain uh, timescales to that. So let's say six months when it being turned on. So if it's not imposed within them six months, they're in breach. I will always be honest, that would then be an enforcement investigation on it, but it will be imposed in them sort of areas. So if you want to put them timescales on, I don't know on the Drayton one if those timescales were imposed. In the answer to the second question, the reason that shall's in there is because the decommissioning statement will be conditioned and preferably I would like to get the use of the land better than what it is right at this moment in time. So it's basically what the decommissioning statement will say and if we agree it will be suitable for the area. At a minimum it should be returned to what it is. Okay, anyone else with any points to clarify? No, let's open up debate. Who would like to kick us off? If I don't see a hand I'll point. Councillor Rolf, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I find it a little bit surprising that, that a project of this magnitude, um, the company didn't feel it, it uh, necessary to kind of do a face-to-face -face consultation um, and felt that a phone call was, was adequate. Uh, I, I find that a, a little bit insulting, really, to um, those that live so close by. Councillor Parry, please. Always me, isn't it? Um, I'm, a, I'm a great advocate of solar energy, but when it's in the right place and it reflects the right um, minimal harm to the landscape. I mean, we currently have a number of neighbouring solar farms I think my biggest issue with this particular application is the split site, because actually, in my view, then the harm is more enhanced because the solar farm isn't condensed to one particular area. Um, I don't have a problem with the um, the area, the site apportioned in Harbury. I think that makes a, a good fit. And in fact, if the adjacent field, if it extended in a continuous way, there would be less harm. But I do have um, concern that it, it gives a sort of cumulative impact as well with the Radford Semele site. Um, I feel there is therefore significant harm on the landscape at the at, attended the site visit this afternoon and no amount of landscaping will overcome the issues that we have here. Um, I therefore, it's a very large area, so for me it also fails on design scale and layout because we've got two disparate 
sites. Um, if one takes our policy CS5 on landscape, the d any development, any proposals must have regard to the local distinctiveness and historic character of the district's diverse landscape. Um, the issue I also have, it, it, it causes, because you've also got um, solar panels that track and turn, I feel that has an urbanisation impact on the village of Ofton. Um, and I'm therefore, for those pl material planning reasons, I propose to refuse. Thank you very much. Councillor Cargill, please. Thank you, Chair. Well, Stratford does appear to be covered in solar farms these days, isn't it? I'm a supporter of solar, uh, but it does take up significant amounts of uh, valuable uh, land. But in fairness, the main concern I had was loss of productivity of that land. And I have been assured by the applicants that the sheep grazing under it will be retained and therefore we haven't lost the productivity of that land. I hope that's the case. Um, if I may, I was a bit unhappy with some of the ifs and buts and can be's and anticipates on page 29, which made or making my decision harder. We have a target becoming carbon neutral, both this authority and the country, and this will inevitably contribute to that goal. Um, previous schemes that I've seen had the same objections. In fairness, that was not the case. It didn't impact as badly as perhaps first thought, and they do fall into the background eventually. It's a bit like large-scale glass houses, and those are the lower, lower impact as well than that. This is a planning balance, and on the one hand, we've got harm perhaps to the land and the visibility, etc. On the other, we are producing more solar energy. Um, therefore, I'm willing to support the officer in this particular case. Thank you. Just so I'm clear, Councillor Cargill, are you proposing grant? Yes, I am. Thank you. Councillor Curtis, please. Thank you, um, I mentioned this um, disparity between the, um, the number of homes, um, and I just think, I just find the found the reply that the applicant needs to use national data or national measurements um, when making this presentation um, you know we're here to look at the impact and benefits to Stratford district I mean that's that's why we've been elected so I, I, it's a it's a small small point but I think we need to question as I said the the national average is 3,800 kilowatts per household in Stratford, it is 4,800. It may not be a material planning consideration, but I think it is information that is relevant and that we need to challenge these figures when they are presented to us to ensure they are representative of what our requirements are. Okay. Thank you very much. Councillor Harvey, please. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, I've got a, a solar panel farm in my ward and it is separated from the minor road that it abuts by field. And I notice um, there's something incongruous about um, the residents of the parish council from Ufton um, being uh, objecting to the northern portion, whereas the parish council from Harbury in relation to the southern portion, I presume, uh, doesn't raise an objection. Um, I've driven down the road from Ufton down to the Foss, along the Foss, and back into Harbury. And my impression is that uh, the impact from by a, by a road user would be relatively small. I, I drove pat particularly past the existing site on the Foss. Um, and if you drive one way, you hardly notice it at all. If you drive the other way, you do notice it somewhat. But um, our, my my view, I think, is on, on balance, and it is on balance, I accept there is some visual harm, is that uh, I would support Councillor Cargill. I, I, I do think the answer we were given into the, in relation to the question about um, 
food loss, food security, was difficult to accept because if I heard it correctly, the logic of it would mean that if there were more solar farms on more agricultural land, we'd have both solar, solar output and increased agricultural output. That is intuitively difficult for me to accept. But on balance, I'm prepared to go with Grant. Uh, just so I'm clear, is that a seconding of Councillor Cargill's proposal? I will second. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Eden, next please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll be honest, I was very much on the side of going with Grant on this until Councillor Parry changed my mind. Um, I think she makes a very good point about that cumulative effect and the almost pincer-like movement of what's going to go on with the tilting and turning. Um, so I will gladly second uh, Councillor Parry's proposal. Thank you very much. You haven't heard me speak yet, so I might change your mind back. Um, Councillor Crump next, please. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I'll see you on early air as well. Um, and I know that um, Bufton has been particularly affected by our friends HS2, um, which has cut them off um, and done significant damage to, to the landscape. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's certainly not certainly not fair. Um, obviously, we've been told that HS2 is the major national infrastructure and Stratford District Council should bear its uh, brunt of that. And in the same way, I think the energy climate emergency, we do have to provide a contribution to national infrastructure. Um, we need to become more less reliant on fossil fuel, fuels and we need to be really less reliant on uh, supplies from from abroad because they again we know recently they can be difficult to get at times especially when there's competition as well and i will just leave it as that um we've, we've uh, somebody mentioned the glass houses in the same effect and it's quite noticeable there are significant glass houses both north and south of the foss roundabout um, and some are quite close to the existing solar panel site along on the south side of the A425 uh, at the Fosway. Um, so I'm on the climate commun climate change panel um, and I do support this application uh, reluctantly, um, but I think we do need to consider the national good, the greater good, and also the fact that when we've got a lack of supply of uh, electricity for our residents that we've been told that potentially in January, February, some of our residents could be losing the power for three hours at, at a time. I think we do need to take steps that we are more secure in our supply of electricity to um, our residents. Thank you very much. Councillor Kendall, please. I think, Chairman, everything has been said basically that I was going to say. I'm just going to finally say if we're going to get serious about um, about climate change and providing renewable sources of energy, we're going to have to make some very difficult decisions. I will be supporting the recommendation to grant. Thank you very much. Councillor Rolfe, please. Uh, well, Councillor Erden got in um, before me because uh, Councillor Parry has changed my mind also. Um, and I think it will have a much bigger impact on Ufton uh, than it will on Harbury. And I uh, there will be that kind of element of urbanisation and I think that is a, a, a planning reason actually to refuse it so I would support the no campaign if, that, if you like. Thank you very much. Councillor Dixon please. Thank you Chairman. I've supported uh, each solar planning application that's come before this committee over the last few years but on this one I can't. Uh, having attended that site visit this afternoon and viewed the northern site, uh, as it were, from the confines of Ufton, essentially I find it uh, an impact on the landscape and I'm on Councillor Perry's side on this particular one, so it'll be an interesting vote, Chairman. I was just thinking the same thing. Councillor Foreman. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, yeah, I've struggled with this one, I must admit, but listening to all the arguments and the, what the thoughts that have gone on today, I think I'm going to have to get, go with Councillor Parry and go in the no camp. OK, anyone else before I chuck in my thoughts? See if I can convince some people. Um, 
I don't necessarily disagree with what everyone has said, both on the pros and the cons. Um, clearly, Ufton sits a, on top of a, a hill. It's certainly higher than the application site. So inevitably, their views are going to be damaged. It doesn't matter whether it's uh, solar panels or a farm or buildings, houses, whatever it might be, anything is going to change that landscape. Um, and it will have harm as a result of that. Um, what I'm trying to do is balance that harm and how much harm that that is, uh, in my view, relatively limited. Certainly from the um, the consultees, even our own conservation officer has said limited uh, weight, uh, sorry, limited harm. Um, Natural England, I noticed, haven't got a comment. Uh, normally on something like this, Natural England would be sending us a lot of information about whether they are for or against. So we've had nothing from them. I, I give weight to that. Um, I also balance that with the weight uh, um, that Councillor Crump spoke about, the desperate need that we have to be self-reliant on our own sources of I'm so sorry, my microphone turned itself off. I hope you got all that. Um, so I'm weighing both in the balance. Um, I think this is a case in point of electricity problems. <laughs> <laughs> We'll get there. We will get there. It doesn't want this thing obviously doesn't want me to say what I've got to say. I think you've got the general gist of it. I'm giving much more weight to the need for us to, to produce that energy um, and the need for us to provide that. So I will be going with Grant. We have had two proposals, both of which have been seconded. Right, everyone give me their microphones. <laughs> me what a palaver um right so let me try that again we've had two proposals one to grant one to refuse the one that was seconded first was the grant so we must listen to that first if that fails we will then take the second proposal which is to refuse and has been seconded what i will want to do if we get to that stage is I want to really draw out more around the reasons for refusal. So while we're going through this process, if you could please put your minds to that, that would be very helpful. Um, so could we please, ah, now before we go to the vote, what I would also add in, so I think Councillor Cargill, you proposed the grant. Um, I have concerns about the connection between the two sites. Um, I'm not clear exactly where it's gonna go and I don't understand I don't believe that the uh, alignment and the, and the delivery of the connection is part of this application. Certainly, it sounded like an S51, I think, was going to be required. So I think we need to add in a condition for engineering connection operations. Are you happy for that to be added? Yeah, I, I, I did think it was part of the section 15. Is it 151, is it? Oh, 151. Yeah. Yeah, I thought it was, but anyway, I'm happy to go I think that. To be belts and braces, I think I'd be more comfortable to include that. So if you're happy, that's great. That was seconded uh, by Councillor Harvey. You're happy with that? addition marvellous so with that addition let's have a vote on that so the proposal is to grant with the addition of the engineering operations condition could i show of hands for those in favor please one two three four five, five. and those against one two three four five six so that therefore fails so uh, we will move then to the proposal to refuse now i will need to draw out more detail on your reasons for refusal please Thank you, Chair. My reasons um, for proposing re refusal is on um, impact to the character of the landscape, CS policy CS5, and also policy CS9, which is design and distinctiveness, which also um, highlights the topography and scale and size of the proposed application. Are you happy?
provided this obviously does get supported by the members of the committee, are you happy to leave the wording of all that to officers? I am, but also as an impact to CS9, it creates an urbanisation to the village of um, Ufton, and there is also, um, whether it can also be included, is the cum cumulative impact because of another neighbouring solar farm. And I think if I just want to stress, it is the northern aspect of this application that is the issue, not the Harbury end. Because the, it's, the impact is on Ufton with the character of the landscape, particularly when we were standing today from the um, gardens of the White Hart, which is a public, it is a public realm, the view onto that landscape, but I'm happy to leave the officers. I, okay, that, that, perfect. I think that's sufficient. Um, uh, I don't think we would be within the condition we'd be able to say this is because of that part, not no. this part. So it will be an all encompassing rather than singling out one yeah. portion or another. But I think I've got I've written down three, possibly four things here, and I can see Joe's written the same thing. Are you guys happy that we've got sufficient there to be able to pro proceed to a vote? Yes. yes sir. Okay, let's go for a vote. So for those, Neely, is there anything you want to add to it? Or are you happy? I think that's wonderful. And forgive me, I should have called you Councillor Evans. I apologise. Um, Would you just check with the manager? Alice? I certainly can. Alice, have you got anything you want to add at this point? No, I don't. Thank you. I think that that summarised everything really well. I've taken notes of uh, uh, Councillor Parry's initial kind of comments when she proposed to refuse, uh, which she's reiterated. So I think we've got enough detail there to be able to formulate a reason for refusal. Lovely. Thank you very much. OK, let's move to a vote then. So the proposal is to refuse planning application 2200001 FUL. Could I have a show of hands for those in favour of refusal? One, two, three, four, five, six. And those against refusal? One, two, three, five, four, five. So committee therefore resolves to refuse application 22000001 FUL, that is land near Middle Road in Harbury for the reasons given. Now, members, I did say earlier on, uh, I'm conscious of time, we have been going for two hours now. I am going to have a comfort break for us all, but it is strict two minutes because we are flirting with our deadline. So please, two minutes, no longer. Yeah. Can I possibly put my 
Yeah, push My Okay, that, the strict two minutes is up. So if I could please ever ask everyone to take their seats as quickly as they possibly can. Yeah, Councillor Curtis to come. Now, members, uh, while, while we're all here, clap everyone's attention again, please. Ladies and gentlemen in the, in the back, if you, couldn't, if you wouldn't mind ceasing your conversations now while we can reconvene. Um, members, we have half an hour before we have to take a vote on whether we continue. I'm very conscious of the fact that we have two quite big applications coming up. I think it's probably worth us taking that vote now. Um, so I'm going to assume, or I'm going to propose that we continue past the 8.30 deadline um, so that we can hear particularly the two larger items. Could I have someone second that, please? Thank you. And could I have a show of hands for those in favour of going past that time? Lovely, that's that's unanimous. Lovely, thank you. Thank, that's a big relief. Um, okay, so our next item is um, planning effort. Uh, and our presenting officer is Amy Flute. Amy, whenever you're ready, over to you. Thank you, Chairman. The site denoted by the black dot is within the built-up area boundary for Stratford-upon-Avon. The application site, edged red, is part of the Kes playing field. The site adjoins Manor Road, a residential street. There are TPO trees which form part of a wider group TPO to the site's western boundary. A Grade 2 listed sports pavilion is to the southeast of the site within the playing field. And planning permission is sought for the erection of six dwellings and two vehicular access points. The site plan on the left indicates the proposed layout dismit, dismissed at appeal by application 20009874. The inspector dismissed the scheme due to the impact on neighbouring amenity and the impact on trees covered by a TPO. The site plan on the right is the site plan for consideration as part of this application. The layout has been revised and all the trees are to be retained on site. There are two house types proposed. Four of the units will be house type A, which can now be seen. Um, these are four bed dwellings. And two of the units will be house type B, again, four bed dwellings. Both house types will be constructed from brick, clay roof tiles and aluminium windows. This image is taken from Manor Road, looking into the application site in an easterly direction. You can see the sports field and the houses which adjoin the perimeter. This image shows the site's northern boundary and the nearest adjoining property, Globe Cottage. The trees which form part of the group TPO can also be seen. This image is looking into the site in a southeasterly direction. The Grade 2 listed pavilion is screened by the existing trees and hopefully this arrow will um, show you the approximate location of it. Um, this image is taken from the playing field looking towards the site in a north-westerly direction and the approximate access locations can be seen. And now some images to demonstrate the character of dwellings along Manor Road. Chairman, it is not considered um, that the proposal will result in unacceptable harm to heritage assets, trees subject to a TPO, landscape, neighbouring amenity, highways or flood risk. 
The recommendation is to grant the application subject to conditions and notes and subject to completion of an agreeable unilateral undertaking as detailed within the committee report. Please note an update on the update sheet and just one verbal update. The bottom of page 60 should read the proposal is considered to be sensitive and safe and accords with policy. Thank you. Amy, thank you very much indeed. Let's call our first speaker on this item, who is Councillor Ian Fradgley of Stratford Raymond Town Council. Good evening, Councillor Fradgley. Thank you for your patience. And while you're getting yourself settled, I just remind you, you'll have three minutes. I'll give you a 30 second warning. And once you are settled and your microphone is on, the floor is yours. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Chair. Stratford Town Council acknowledges the built up area of Stratford Town on the provider that there are plenty of green and open spaces also provided amongst the housing. And there is no doubt that Manor Road with homes on the north side and tree lined fields on the south side is one of the finest examples of this within the built up areas of Stratford, which no doubt this committee have also experienced if they've uh, made a, uh, a site visit. <clears throat> I anticipate other speakers this evening will cover the pros and cons of this application, so the Town Council would like to concentrate on the aspect of the wonderful rows of trees involved. There has already been an example set south of the river regarding trees and hedges in this situation, being on the west side of Kipling Road in which the trees and hedges were similarly uh, to remain in place during construction and perpetuity, when the poppy meadow development was being proposed and developed on the fields on opposite uh, side of Kipling Road. If this committee is inclined to accept the planning officer's decision proposal, then the town council would request that a, a condition is applied to safeguard all the existing trees facing Manor Road and the root protection zones of all these trees, such that of the proposed building plots <laughs> Sorry, such that none of the proposed building plots nor proposed internal roads on the site encroach onto the root protection zones of the trees. And during the development phase, no delivery vehicles, site workers' vehicles and storage of materials should encroach onto the root prote protection zones of the trees. Thank you. Councillor Fragney, thank you very much. Members, do we have any questions for Councillor Fragney? <laughs> Councillor Crump? Again, sorry, um, Councillor Fraggs, you expressed some concerns about protecting the trees if we were minded to grant. Is that why you were... You sorry? Were... I can't sorry. hear you very well. Um, you, you, were my, you, you were expressing concerns about the protection of trees from the plots if we were minded to grant. Was that your, your, your comment? I, I couldn't quite hear as well, so yeah. I think these are microphones. Sorry. Yes, the, the Town Council is very... Uh, uh, it, it wants each party to know what they can and cannot do. And the only way you can start that off is by, by having it written down. Uh, there have been incidents in this town, and I'm not going to name where, where suddenly hedges and trees are taken down overnight. Um, and that's what we're trying to uh, protect. OK, any other questions? No, in that case, Councillor Fragi, thank you very much for your time and patience this evening. OK, let's move to our next speaker, who is a Mr. David Neal. Good evening, Mr. Neal. And again, thank you very much for your patience. Thank you, Chairman. Once you're settled and comfortable, you'll have three minutes. Again, I'll give you a 30 second warning. If you stay seated for questions afterwards, that'd be great. Press the button in the middle. It will go red and the floor is yours. However laudable the ambitions of CARES to improve the sports field at Manor Road, it cannot be de detriment to the detriment of the green space policy in the area. Section 15 of the Listed Building and Conservation Act 1990 states, the curtilage of a building, i.e. the principal building, is in general terms any area of land and other buildings that are around and associated with that principal building. This statement is confirmed in Historic England's listed Building and Curtilage Consultation Draft 20, uh, of the 27th of January 2017. English Heritage, Historic England, further state that they remain concerned by the potential damage by development, contrary to the established planning policy put forward as a way of benefiting significant places, but destroy more than they save. 
The policy that they use to determine acceptability includes five criteria. It will not harm the heritage value of the place or setting. Enabling development is a type of public subsidy and should be subject to the same degree of financial scrutiny, scrutiny and transparency and accountability as a cash grant from public sources. Mr. Sargent, Secretary of State Inspector, in paragraph six of his report, concedes that criterion three could well be seen to conflict in reducing the size of the adjacent pitches, which would need to be made smaller to compensate for the loss of land. And criterion four, which allows for the provision of land at other schools to replace that which is lost, is ignored by Kez's application. Kes have admitted to raising four million for other school projects, and we see no reason why funds for this project cannot be raised without the loss of this sports area, which the inspector acknowledged that little evidence to support its position was evidenced or extensive. The National Policy Planning Framework Policy CLW1, protecting and enhancing existing community facilities, paragraphs 11, 10, 12, page 127 states, outdoor community facilities, including playing fields, sports facilities, and other recreational land will be protected against the loss of encroachment. No reference to these policies was made by the inspector. Stratford's core strategy in its long time coming is not to be treated lightly or thrown aside with enabling factors to cr cross its path. 30 seconds. It is our coherent system for planning the future. The core strategy for which councillors have signed up states PCC COM and PCC 17, development should protect and enhance our natural built in historic environment. <coughs> in the assessment core strategy on land parcels for future usage on the edge of Stratford, Manor Road is not on the list of considerations. The core strategy acknowledges that the quality of life should aim for a high quality, multifunctional green infrastructure. Mr. Neil, I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask you to wrap up. I'll give you a couple I'll of seconds. Stop. You'll stop. That's even better. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Members, do we have any... <laughs> Members, do we have any questions for Mr. Neil, please? No? In that case, Mr. Neil, thank you very much for your time and contribution. Okay, our next speakers in this item are Mr. Frampton and Mr. Carr. Good evening to you both. Now, you'll have six minutes. Um, my microphone's gone again. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. So you'll have six minutes. Um, are you? Uh, is it just yourself, Mr. Carr, that's going to be speaking for we're, six minutes? Or are you, are you splitting? Uh, do you understand the timings of your splits? Do you want me to give you warnings? We're fine. Thank you. You're all well practiced and versed in this. So, okay. Practice. In that case, I won't give you any warnings at all until your six minutes is up, and then I'll, I'll shut you down at that point. Whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Chair. Our, our long-standing aim is to create a state-of-the-art sporting hub with the benefits split equally between the school and the community. The funds released from this development, which lies outside the area used for sport, will allow desperately needed sports facilities to be built. Since first obtaining planning permission for a floodlit all-weather pitch in 2008, we have explored various potential funding streams, but regrettably, our efforts have been unsuccessful. Without this proposed development, there is no reasonable chance that these facilities will be re realised in the foreseeable future. Central to the scheme is a floodlit all-weather pitch for which planning permission has already been granted. This facility, which will primarily be used for uh, hockey and tennis, but can also be used for a variety of sports including football, will mean that our teams will no longer have to travel by minibus to Solihull every day to train and to play home fixtures. The walkable facility at Manor Road will therefore reduce travel costs and carbon emissions, but most importantly, will enable all of our students, not just those in teams, to participate in hockey and tennis. The new sports facilities enabled by the development will also be of demonstrable benefit to our sports club partners in the town, being available for community use over 50 hours per week during term time and over 80 hours per week during the holidays. These facilities, for example, are desperately needed by the growing Stratford Hockey Club, who, play, who are currently playing home matches on a weekly basis in Warwick, and Stratford Town Colts 
uh, Stratford Town Colts Football Club, who are urgently need more floodlit facilities for some with some of their 34 teams travelling as far afield as Warwick University to train and play. As part of our plans, the 1971 Sports Pavilion will be restored and internally modernised. The outdated boys' communal changing and shower areas will be replaced by four new men's and women's changing rooms with individual shower cubicles and accessible toilet facilities, as well as a first aid room. The plans include a new access road leading to a 60 space car and coach park, which will significantly reduce local congestion, especially on weekend match days. Importantly, the new road will also allow disabled access to the pavilion and enable emergency visit vehicles to reach pitch side, which, are not current, which is not currently possible in wet weather. We were pleased that the inspector acknowledged the significant benefits that our plans will have for the community and the school and concluded that with some adjustments, there was no reason the scheme, uh, the scheme could not be delivered. The revised plans aim to address directly the changes recommended by the inspector and we hope that you'll be able to accept your officer's recommendation, which in turn will enable us to implement our ambitious plans to provide sporting facilities that this town and the school so desperately need and which has widespread public support. Thank you. Uh, there are those who continue to hold a root and branch objection to the loss of effectively a small peripheral area of the playing fields to enable the provision of enhanced sports facilities. For those who object, uh, the recent inspector's decision is a fundamental consideration. Indeed, the planning practice guidance states that the persistence by a local planning authority objecting to a scheme or elements of a scheme, which an inspector has previously indicated to be acceptable, is an example of unreasonable behaviour. The inspector has reached a decision that the principle of this development is acceptable. He raised two specific design concerns, namely the relationship of plot one to Glebe Cottage and the loss of trees from the TPO. The design, the revised design comes in this application. These design concerns have been satisfactorily addressed. There will be no loss of trees from this scheme. Uh, and in response to uh, an earlier question about trees um, during construction, You'll note there are shorthand conditions relating to a construction management plan, condition three, condition eight, an agricultural method statement, and another condition that requires the service runs to be submitted to and approved by the LPA. In terms of the heritage consideration, again, that is a matter that was addressed by the inspector, paragraph 35 of his decision letter, the experience of the pavilion would therefore not be diminished. So that inspector has considered uh, and considered satisfactory. He considered the principle was satisfactory. As I said, he identified two very specific design concerns which have now been addressed. Thank you. Thank you both. Well, within your six minutes. Members, do we have any questions for either of our speakers? Councillor Parry first. Thank you and good evening, gentlemen. Um, I just wondered whether you can explain um, why your properties are based on four bedrooms rather than three bedrooms, which would then conform to the SBD parking regulations of Stratford District Council. The issue here is clearly to uh, raise finance in the development of the land to enable the sports pitches and the all weather pitch and the works to the pavilion to be uh, uh, achieved by the revenue of that. So it's important that uh, the value of that land is maximised. Uh, and it's an issue that, again, the inspector considered and had no issue with the size of dwellings that were proposed for this application. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions they would like to ask Councillor Adam? Thank you. Um, with regards to the um, all-weather pitch that you're talking about, um, presume, presume that's been granted planning permission already. Can you just enlighten me to when that was and how that process came about at that time? 2008. 2008 was the original permission. 2016, there was a Section 73 application which uh, granted 
permission with varied conditions, and that permission has been lawfully implemented. Okay, so and it hasn't been constructed as of yet. No, no, no. The, the, this is the the whole genesis of this application is to provide the finance because there is no other means of financing the delivery of those sports pitches. So how how is it that we're so many years down the line before we're seeing this application, considering that that was part of the core to funding it? Then you might want to answer that, but I mean, from my point, we've obviously had an appeal. We've had a previous application which was refused, uh, and then we've had the inspector's decision. But the school was going through various exercises to try and find the finance from the Sports Council, a lottery fund. Ben will uh, ex extend that in terms of the efforts that have gone through to try and finance it other than this enabling development. Final question. Um, have you conducted a financial viability assessment to back this up uh, sort of more independently, let's say? Is there kind of some, have our officers been able to kind of Verify what you're saying. I, I, so I don't, I don't think it's relevant to us how these guys finance their developments. What's relevant to us is what's put in front of us in our planning policies. I'm going to ask you to retract that, I'm afraid. Okay, yeah. Do we have any other questions? Councillor Crump? It's just to clarify my last point, and I think Mr Frampton had, had answered it, but just to make sure. So other alternative sources of funding had been exhausted so therefore this is the way you're going to fund the scheme uh, for the uh, sports, uh, sports we, we, we're pushing the boundaries of what we're permitted to do we we shouldn't be discussing finances in public if you want to discuss the finances in any great detail we have to go into a uh, closed session which means i'm going to have to eject everybody in the uh, in the hall i don't think it's relevant uh, to our planning decision we're here to make a decision on what's put in front of us based on planning policy Okay. Do we have any other questions? No. In that case, both of you, thank you very much for your time, contribution and your patience. Okay. Our final speaker on this item is Councillor Rolf. Councillor Rolf, you make your way forward. I think you understand the drill. Five minutes, 30 second warning. Use as much or as little as the five minutes as you wish. When you're ready and comfortable, turn your microphone on and the floor is yours. Firstly, I would like to say that when the inspector came to visit the site, it was during COVID and there were no cars parked along the road. And secondly, he stated in his inspector's report that the road is unlined. This is wrong. There are double yellow lines along the road opposite Beach Close, making a third of the road unparkable at any time. And this is very significant, Councillor Parry, uh, what you asked earlier. Now to go to the report. CS15 states on page 50 of the report, this site is not an allocated site for residential development and it is not in the NDP. In fact, the NDP goes on to say that this area is the green lung south of the river. CS15 also states that development is expected to protect and enhance the character. This does neither. It's a row of boring looking modern houses set within the curtilage of a grade two listed building completely out of character with the surrounding area. These houses will obscure the view to the listed pavilion for most residents. Page 51, policy CS16, we have an over-provision of homes, but the planner seems to say that Stratford can accommodate a further six dwellings. Why should we? Page 51, policy CS25.2, there is no need, and six houses does not make a valuable contribution to the character and amenity. Page 52, Sport England have objected. Please read what they say. Page 60, there is an under-provision of seven parking spaces. We have a clear policy on the number of parking spaces each four-bedroom house should have, three per house with visitor parking. Why is this being ignored? Please also note that there is a planning permission for a further entrance down the road, causing a further loss of five, six spaces. Highways didn't take this into account. There could be a loss of 12, 13 parking spaces in total. This is shocking and even more shocking that highways didn't object. I've already stated that the inspector got it wrong about the road being unlined when he reviewed it. County highways can get it wrong as well. 
There is St Peter's Mission on this road, which runs regularly community activities. Where, the, where will the users park? I've had a group of coordinators uh, crying to me about having to close their clubs if this application goes ahead. The Vicar of Alveston is seriously concerned about the future of some of the community activities run by the church because of lack of parking. At a recent application in Warwick where highways said parking was below standard but shouldn't be too much of an issue, the planning committee listened to what the residents said and took a brave decision and turned the application down on parking grounds. Please be brave, this is serious. And now the trees, the most important visual aspect of Manor Road with a wealth of TPO trees. And again, the inspector read the report written by the applicant and was satisfied that the trees will survive. Really? Of course they won't. No amount of protection will stop the constant use of machinery vibrating over the land slowly, but surely damaging the roots of the trees and the disregard of the builders. We've all seen this. Oh, it won't be a problem attitude. What about the scaffolding and cranes with the canopies of these beautiful trees? They or most of the trees will not survive this carnage and we've seen builders break the conditions and then it's too late. Let's be brave. We've had years and years of CARES putting in applications. Four people have upped and sold because they can't take the constant harassment and uncertainty any longer. At a meeting several years ago, we suggested to the head that we as a group would help fundraise for their reconfigurations of the land. We could have raised it by now and we wouldn't be here fighting once again. They don't need a state-of-the-art rugby pitch, which the inspector agrees could be smaller due to conflicting with Criterion 3, bottom of page 53. The rugby club, less than 100 yards away, have proposals to put two full-size pitches in on their land. There will be no benefits to the community, as all use will be restricted to when the school aren't using it, and, and charities and community groups will be charged. You know they can't give it for free. No one can. They receive over half a million pounds yearly from the town trust. No other school in Stratford gets anything. Kes is a privileged school. They could raise the money to do what they want without building six hideous looking houses, spoiling everyone's outlook and ruining people's livelihoods in the process. The people living around the playing fields have had enough. I don't mean to sound patronising, but please be brave. No two inspectors will see the same issues or indeed come to the same conclusion. And the last one didn't do a complete fact check either. The inspector got his facts wrong about the lines on the road. This is a very, very important issue. This affects the parking along all of this road. And this is a huge issue and can be dealt with as a reason for refusal. I urge you to refuse this application. Thank you. Councillor Roll, thank you very much indeed. Members, do we have any questions for our ward member, please? No, looks like all bases covered. Councillor Roll, thank you very much for your time and contribution. Okay, let's move to points of clarification of our officers. Who would like to ask a question? Councillor Dixon first, please. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, we heard from, I think it was uh, Peter Frampton, um, that uh, the only uh, aspects we really ought to be perhaps considering are those which the inspector drew and gave his reasons for the appeal failing. And therefore, we, are we only really to consider the trees and the impact, I think it was plot one on the neighbouring property? Because um, I think that was the, uh, the comment from the agent there. Uh, if uh, Amy would like to comment, please. So um, obviously, um, in, in, in the determination of the application, you have to consider all, everything, um, which is a material planning consideration. Um, the planning inspector's um, report um, is a material consideration in the determination of the planning application. My officer report has gone through um, the view and my view, and then obviously taken in consideration the, the points from the inspector. Um, and I have come to the view in my officer recommendation that um, the matters um, have, have been addressed as part of the resubmission um, of this planning application, which the inspector dismissed the previous application on. If I may follow up, uh, Chairman, because um, I think the agent was made some reference to if we were to refuse this and disagree with a comment or an uh, part of that inspector's report, that would be a justification for fees and costs against us, something like that? Um, as I said, yes, so the um, appeal um, decision is a material consideration um, and it 
is um, potential that if you were to go against um, the views of the inspector, it may open up costs um, in the future. I'll, I'll just see if Alice has anything she'd like to add to that point. Thanks, Amy. Yeah, just, just to reiterate exactly what Amy said, I think that the thing to bear in mind is the inspector's decision is a material planning consideration that we have to have regard to in the determination of the application. I think it's uh, I think a part of the PPG was referred to by um, the applicant or their agent there in terms of, you know, it being a potential grounds for costs where an inspector has found a matter to be acceptable. If there hasn't been any changes in the resubmission, but we determine to refuse, then we could potentially be in cost territory. So I think it is a fair thing to, to kind of warn members that there is a danger of that. If you find things that are unacceptable, the, the inspector did consider to be acceptable. Councillor Parry. Thank you, Chair. Um, could I just ask, because I, I haven't seen the full um, appeal uh, decision on this particular application. Um, if the inspector made reference to the parking SPD criteria um, and what weight um, in terms of a policy of an approved Stratford District Council policy that has been through consultation should we be giving to? Let me just find the relevant part of the inspector's decision. In the meantime, while Amy's pulling that up, could I just come in, please? Of course you can. I think something I'd just like to clarify is that obviously we do have the, the recommended parking standards as set out in our SPD. Um, but I, I obviously, um, Councillor Parry referred to its policy. Strictly speaking, it's not policy. It doesn't form part of our core strategy policy. It is obviously guidance. It's contained within uh, the SPD, which we have made and we've considered and we've decided to adopt. So it is obviously a material planning consideration, but they are recommended guidance rather than policy. I just wanted to make that point. Thank you, that's very helpful. Amy? Um, I'm, I'm happy to read the paragraph from the inspector's decision, if that helps. Um, so it states, um, this is paragraph 41. The council also contended that each house should have a minimum of three on-site spaces plus a visitor space. The development falls short of this, with only 12 to be provided in total. I recognise that if demand reached the level anticipated by the council, this could well result in parking being displaced off site. However, mindful of the acknowledged capacity of Manor Road to accommodate parked vehicles and noting too the site's proximity to the town centre, it has not been demonstrated that this would impact highway safety unacceptably. Does that answer your question? I think it probably does. Okay, do we have, oh, we do, sorry. Uh, Councillor Cargill, please. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, right, just picking up the point about the trees and the TPOs, etc. Uh, I'm assuming that you've considered this thoroughly about the protection of those trees. Can you just explain what protection measures you would be put in place for those? Okay, so um, a tree report has been submitted as part of the application. Um, and um, if I just go to a different plan. Um, so um, one of the recommended conditions is that the development is carried out in accordance with the tree report. Um, some of these plans are from the tree report, which um, indicates that um, there's going to be um, protective um, fencing barrier in two different to be cell web and root bridge um, to protect the root protection areas um, where there is some incursion into the root protection areas of those TPO trees. Um, the Report also states that um, one limb of T13 um, is to be removed um, and that there would also be some crown lifting to T6, T10 and T11. So obviously that tree report would be conditioned and they'd have to um, carry out the development in accordance with that. In addition, the tree report states that um, a condition should also be provided for an arbicultural method statement so that we can pin down that finer detail. Um, and that is another condition which is recommended. In addition, a condition for service runs so that we can be satisfied where the services are going to be going to make sure that they don't unacceptably harm the trees any further. Councillor Foreman, please. Thank you. Just going back to parking again, sorry, but Councillor Rolfe said in her, when she gave her uh, talk that um, there were double yellow lines on Manor Road 
that the inspector hadn't mentioned in his report. Is that the case or not? Um, I've just had a quick um, glance over the section of the report and I'm just going to ask Councillor Richards if he will too, because I couldn't see anything to that effect, but that could just be me reading it quickly. So if, if that's OK. Yeah, bear with me. OK. Councillor Rolf, Councillor Rolf, please don't shout out, particularly when I'm trying to read and uh, 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 absorb evidence. We will come to you in just a moment. I'm um, hope hopefully this is going to help. Um, the inspector doesn't refer to any double yellow lines along the road. What he does refer to is his observation, and I will read you his observation. When I visited, some cars were parked along the east side of Manor Road by the application site, although there was still space for more vehicles. So clearly, he's observed cars parked along that road, albeit the east side of it. I'm only going. I'm going to assume, and this is an assumption, not an absolute. I'm going to assume he is referring to the side opposite uh, this site. So, if you're, yeah, if you're looking out, it's on the other side. Um, that's as good as I can give you. Really, he doesn't specifically refer to double yellows, but he does refer to cars being parked along that eastern side of Manor Road. OK, so but we we don't know for a fact if there are double yellow lines or not or how far they are or. Um, I, no. I went to um, to site um, I just drove by earlier this morning and there are some double yellow lines as you enter Manor Road. Um, and and obviously. I was I was driving, so I don't know the exact positionings. Um, but as you travel further north along Manor Road, the double yellows do then stop, and then you can freely park on on the um, eastern side of the carriageway. I didn't check on, uh, what the line situation was um, while I was there, but that was just my driving observation as I was driving down the road. Um, I'm I, so just so we're clear, I'm not presenting this as evidence. I'm just giving you an observation again. I've got the Google map open now at the precise site here. I can't see evidence of yellow lines. What I can see is cars parked on both sides of the road. Okay. Um, but clearly it's for you to decide and discern from the information you've been given what you believe to be correct. OK, just uh, bear with me, Councillor Parry. Um, Councillor Rolf, before you jump in, you have a right for points of um, a point of order. Is yours a point of order? Mine is a point of order. OK, if you'd like to come forward. <coughs> actually, it's two points of order. The first point of order is that it was actually the Mr. Frampton's report that said there were no lines on the road. I can absolutely guarantee there are lines on the road. As the county okay. councillor, I had them put in because people from Beach Close could not exit or go into their own road and there are double yellow lines along the eastern side okay of i'm going to stop Manor you road. there because that wasn't a point of order that was a statement of fact which okay. i'm quite happy for you to give now but yeah we'll, we'll leave it at that i think for the timing councillor dixon was next thank you chairman i don't know if it has any relevance or not um i was just looking at page 60 where uh, Amy's report, uh, the site is not within the town boundary. That did surprise me when I read that. 
is that of any importance at all? So that's reference to part O of the development requirements SPD, which sets out um, the areas of parking distribution um, for Stratford. So within the town centre boundary for Stratford, it has a lesser parking requirement than what the rest of Stratford does that's outside of that boundary. So hopefully that clarifies that point. So it's OK. Mm. Councillor Crump. Councillor Dixon, you should check your microphones off, please. Councillor Crump. Very briefly, um, if I heard Amy correctly, the, the planning inspector said the reliance on our SPD for three parking spaces for four bedroom properties wasn't particularly strong or relevant because there was um, sufficient parking in Manor Road and elsewhere. Is that correct? And if that is the case, would that have been since checked by the County Council in their response back to us? So the, the inspector was satisfied that the level of provision that has been provided is acceptable. Um, in terms of the response um, from highways, um, I can if you if you just give me two seconds, I can I can get that up and just have a look to see if they made reference. So within um, the no objection from highways, they have stated the applicant acknowledges that the proposed on-site parking for two parking spaces per dwelling is below that set out in the SDC SPD. However, they note that this matter was fully reviewed by the planning inspector in the previous appeal decision at paragraphs 41 to 42, who concluded that whilst the parking proposals fell short of SPD levels, this would not lead to demonstrable or unacceptable harm to highway safety. The highway authority notes that the quantum of on-site parking has been considered acceptable by the planning inspectorate. As such, it is acknowledged that an objection based on insufficient on-site parking causing unacceptable harm to highway safety would be very unlikely to be sustained. Does that help? That is very helpful, thank you. Okay. Councillor Parry. Thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor Rolfe made reference to when the inspector visited the site being during COVID, and I note the appeal was refused on the 20th November 2020. Um, obviously, during the period of COVID, many sort of clubs and that sort of thing were doing um, activities via Zoom and people not going and mixing so much. Um, I'm just interested to know whether there was, whether you had any indication of the date of when the inspector actually visited the site and whether Councillor Rolfe is correct in her presentation of saying it was during COVID, which obviously would explain why there were not so many parked cars in Manor Road at that time. That's an easy question because the appeal decision states that the site visit was made on the 5th of July 2021. My birthday. Councillor Adam, did you signal? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, um, amongst the highways aspect in terms of parking, the, what seems to be accepted by the um, appeal and then highways as a result is that there's no detriment to highway safety. Is there another metric by which we determine parking to be acceptable or unacceptable outside of being safety, like congestion? <laughs> For, a, for example, sort of, it might not cause highway safety, but it might be a detriment to the residential amenity type of thing. Do you see what I mean? Um, so, obviously, highways have um, reviewed the proposal from a highway safety point of view, and they are happy. In terms of um, an amenity point of view, um, 
as an officer, I'm, I'm satisfied that there, there is sufficient provision and it wouldn't cause unacceptable harm. The inspector does make reference to um, light light glare from vehicles into the neighbouring properties and the inspector did find that that wouldn't be unacceptable. So that may help to some extent. OK, have we got any more points of clarification? No, in that case, let's move into the debate. Who's going to kick us off? The pointy fingers coming out. Councillor Kendall. <coughs> OK, thank you for pointing at me, Chairman. Um, right, I can certainly understand why residents aren't keen on this. But we've gone around the houses, and I'm afraid at the end of the day, I just cannot see s substantial grounds to go against this. It's been seen by an, uh, by an inspector already who's, and we do have to take that into account. I think it was Councillor Dixon who said, you know, talking about costs. We can't keep sending this back to an, you know, to an appeal to an inspector. I can't see a reason to go against it, so I'm happy to propose we grant. Thank you very much, Councillor Cargill. Thank you, Chair. Um, the officer has said that we can't actually consider all elements of the report and therefore was considering the inspector's comments, we can offer our own options. Um, right, the reason is given by the applicant are laudable. The, may, the sports are vital to the health outcomes of our youth of our area. Uh, the scheme will provide much needed funds. So I'm not opposed in principle to the development, but I do have concerns over the buildings. I feel personally that the site is overdeveloped and has an overbearing nature due to the size and bulk of the buildings vis-a-vis -vis the local street scene, which are obviously significantly smaller than that single dwelling, uh, single story. <clears throat> the plan demonstrates insufficient car parking spaces, which is against guidance. And I feel I should mention that we've been enforcing those conditions for some time now on many planning applications. So I don't see why it should be different here. There is a 10 year housing and land supply. This is not local need. And in my mind, it's therefore failed to demonstrate need. I noticed an interesting one on the amenity space. It says, although there's a view of open fields, uh, from properties three to six, it does not uh, and does not create overlooking, but does not equate in my mind to the required 10.5 meters of actual amenity space that can be physically used. It seems that it could be argued that no gardens are needed if you can see a field from them. Uh, Sports England have robustly objected to the scheme and it fails to meet any of the criteria, E1 to E5. Concerns, obviously, over drainage of the site though, that can be um, conditioned. As always, there is planning balance, but I feel there is a sufficient justification of what I've just said uh, to go oppose granting plan permission. Just so I'm clear, are you proposing a refusal? Happy to oppose, uh, yes. Yes, thank you very much. Councillor Dixon, please. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I support uh, Councillor Kendall's view and I will second his uh, proposal to grant. Thank you very much. Anyone else wants to come in? Councillor Parry? Always one to come and make a difference. Um, I'd like to support Councillor Cargill's proposal. I have great issues because of the parking situation. How often are we sat around this committee? We are refusing um applications for four bedroom houses because we haven't got sufficient parking in front now i take note that of the inspector's comments um and the reason for dismissal but there were in my view there are extenuating circumstances here um as someone who uses manor road on a regular basis um and even had um, my daughter's third birthday party at St. Peter's Mission, I can assure you the amount of events that are held at the uh, fantastic facility, it's even hard to park in the current circumstances when there's an event going on there. I do think we need to stand by our guidelines and have consistency across all applications. And it is, in my view, this, this application, if it came back as an application for six three bedroom houses, I wouldn't have an objection because it would not violate the SPD parking guidelines and it wouldn't be over development of the site because there would be 
um, it would be more balanced, in my view, with the properties in Manor Road. So on that basis, I will be supporting Councillor Cargill's refusal. I'm going to assume that's a, a formal uh, seconding of. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak at this point in the debate? Councillor Crump. All right, it looks like I'm um, in between two people who are opposed to me today. Um, yeah, I, 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 I will be supporting the application. I've got concerns about going against the planning inspector and we've been told by the planning manager that their decision holds material weight. We've not had any objection on terms of road safety and parking from the highways authority who are the lead authority on parking. And um, again, I, I've, I think some of the applications while it's been done, which I've been told, are, yeah, I, I can understand why it's been done and why it's been used to fund and I've, I've got sympathy there, so I, I won't go on to that. So, I think each site is different, so therefore, it's yeah, each 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 site is different. I certainly do agree with it. I think it's difficult, and we talk about consistency. We had something on the previous application, on the application before, regarding our um, bins and. Uh, 25 metres or 30 metres, and then we then we went to 70 metres. So so we're not consistent. So therefore, I will be supporting the officer's recommendation to grant because I think that the decision made by the planning inspector holds material and significant weight. Thank you very much. Anyone else wish to contribute before we move to a vote? No. OK, so we have uh, two proposals, both of which have been seconded again. Um, the first is to grant, uh, proposed by Councillor Kendall, seconded by Councillor Dixon. We must take that first and then we will take the second if we need to get that far. So the proposal is to grant in line with the officer's recommendation. Could I please have show hands for those in favour of granting? One, two, three, four, five. And those against? One, two, three, four, five, six. OK, so that uh, therefore fails. So we now have a proposal to refuse um, the reasons that Councillor Cargill gave, I believe, uh, street scene, overdevelopment of site, uh, contrary to our parking SPD um, and not identified as a local need. Is that correct? Or are there more? and by bulk. I think that fits in with overdevelopment. Okay. Is there anything else you want to add to it? You're happy? Um, seconded by uh, Councillor Parry, I believe. Um, there's nothing else you want to add at this point. OK, could I please have a show of hands for those in favour of refusing for the reasons that have been given? One, two, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. And those against? One, two, three, four, five. OK, committee therefore resolves to refuse application 21-04006 FUL. OK, we'll very quickly move into our next application, which is application reference 21040. Sorry. Oh, excuse me, bear with me. Alice, do you want to come in? Yes, please. I just need to clarify the reasons for refusal. I know it's a bit OK, late. just bear with Sorry, to... Alice, just bear with me because the people are moving. So we'll just take two seconds and I'll, I'll come back to you. Thank you. OK, if we could just settle down again, please. I think most people have now made their way out. Now, we just um, uh, our planning manager, Alice, has just asked for clarification on a couple of things. I think you said on the reasons for refusal, Alice. Is that right? Yeah, so that's... just to uh, I've wrote them down and I've put my paper in the wrong place. Hang on. I think from my side, I, if I tell you what I heard and then I can just check that that, that corresponds with, with what the, the decision was. You can, yeah. On. You might have to speak up a bit because oh. for some reason you're a bit quieter than you were 10 minutes ago. 
I don't usually get that criticism. OK, so um, the, the things that I um, picked up from Councillor Cargill was overdevelopment of the site and overbearing to the street scene being much larger than what's around it. So I think that's kind of a, a CS9 design reason. Um, I then also wrote down that there was obviously insufficient parking, um, doesn't comply with the guidance set out in the SPD. So that would be a CS26 reason. So that's two reasons. And then a couple of other things which were put out there was insufficient amenity space, a robust objection from Sports England and it, the not being a local need. I'm a bit concerned about those reasons for the reasons set out in the report in terms of, yes, the lengths aren't there, but they do. The areas do comply in garden terms to the SPD. So that's in terms of the insufficient amenity space point. That wasn't discussed as part of the vote. The vote was on street Fine. scene development, uh, scale and bulk, car parking and no local need. I'm entirely happy that those are in place. Um, the two others that you refer to, the Sport England and the amenity space, weren't included. OK, so in terms of no local need, so what would be the policy hook for that reason for refusal? Simply no identified local need. Um, Councillor oh, yeah, because do you want to... it, it hasn't been put forward as a local needs scheme. So I think we, no. we're, it's a bit tricky to say that it, it doesn't comply with the local need because they're not asking for that, that type of development. Um, Um, Alice, perhaps, so I, I understand your point. Um, I think this is, we, we've obviously, we've discussed these and we've taken a vote already and I'm not going to go back through all that. Most people have already gone um, and uh, our members are here. We've made the decision based on those four criteria, the wording of which is as usual. As outside of this meeting, agree the wording and then I can confirm that with the proposal in a second before we move forward with it. I think that's the most logical thing to do. Thank you for bringing it up. Um, right, sorry. Let's try again. Oh, it's been so straightforward tonight, hasn't it? Um, OK, so our next item is application reference 2200748 Vary. That's land off Banbury Road in Pillerton Priors. Our presenting oh. officer is Paul Thompson. And as soon as he is set up and ready to go, it's open to him. Beg your pardon. Update sheet. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mistyped the application number on the uh, in the report, so that's been corrected on the update sheet. And secondly, we had a committee site visit this afternoon. Uh, Councillor Richards, chair, and uh, Councillor Dixon and I were in attendance with uh, three neighbours. Uh, Pillerton Priors are on the Banbury Road, uh, main road through the village, and. This is a site in a bit more detail. The red buildings are listed buildings. They're, they're not affected by this proposal directly. Uh, green lines are public rights of way, likewise unaffected. Uh, so we're talking about three applications rather than one, helpfully. Um, nothing like a nice simple one to end on. Uh, the first one was granted permission in 2019. It's the one on screen now. 
Um, things to take note of, two parking spaces to the right, visibility displays here, and the distance between the front elevation of the house and what I've taken as my reference point is the, the fence post at the corner of the neighbouring garden, that distance being 5.3 metres. See also the position of the hedge. These things will become important. Uh, this is how the house itself looked uh, when we granted permission for it. Uh, 9.7 metres to the top of the chimney. Uh, I must stress here that these are the measurements on the plans. You may hear others this evening. 9.7 metres to the top of the chimney, 8 metres to the ridge line, and 5.5 metres to the lower ridge line on, on the left there. Uh, you will note there is no second floor, there are no roof lights. That changes here. This is the uh, application that we refused last year in 2021. Uh, you'll note here three parking spaces. Uh, you'll note also that the hedge has moved forwards from the uh, the fence post there. And you'll note also that the house has moved forwards uh, a similar sort of distance, 3.6 metres now being the distance from down from five point whatever I said three. Um, reason for those three parking spaces helpfully indicated with a big red circle is that we now have a second floor with two bedrooms in it that brings the total of bedrooms to five uh, that means we need three parking spaces um, we'll you'll also see that whilst the chimney has come down from 9.7 to 9.3 meters uh, the ridge line the ridge lines plural have gone up to 8.4 and 5.9 that's an increase on the plan of about not between 0.4 and 0.5 meters depending on how you you uh, round it. Uh, you'll see also some roof lights to facilitate those bedrooms in the uh, rear roof uh, slope. There are some other changes. There's, the, there's this uh, chimney breast, which is now external on the side elevation. Um, and I think everybody would agree that the remaining changes to uh, the window arrangements on the front and on the rear are pretty uncontroversial. Um, the main issue in this application was the uh, parking to the front. Um, the county highways engineer concluded that the uh, there was no way basically you could park three decently sized vehicles on the, the space that was left after the dwelling had come forward without some really awkward maneuvers that would have involved knocking into the house, into the hedge or reversing in the road and causing a pile up. So, that was the reason for refusal. The case officer at the time concluded that the impact on uh, neighbour amenity, local character and distinctiveness, all the other um, things we take into account was acceptable. Moving on to the current application, you'll note the site plan is the same, nothing has changed there. Um, we're now down to two parking spaces again though, that's because top floor, bedrooms have gone, it's now a storage area. The uh, rear roof slope, the roof lights have gone, they've been tiled over. Um, the the other changes that were proposed last year, they're remaining basically. So highway County Highways has requested a road safety audit, received a road safety audit, determined that that was acceptable and they've withdrawn their objections. So the, the only reason for refusal was highways, as I say, that is there's now no objection for that. Uh, so that is where we are. Uh, this is the house from the front. This is from uh, the garden of um, Brook House, off my head, to the uh, east. And finally, from the garden of one, um, forgive me, um, the house to the west anyway, uh, looking side onto it, the cul-de-sac, whatever it's called. It's in my report, read it. Um, my recommendation is to uh, grant permission for the reasons therein. Uh, the Parish Council disagree. That's why we're here. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Paul. Let's call our first speaker of, uh, of this item, who is Councillor Ian Greenhall, Chairman of Person Prize Parish Council. Good evening and welcome. Good evening. I think you've got a gist of what's going to happen. You've got three minutes. I'll give you a 30 second warning before your time is up. Otherwise, whenever you're ready and your microphone is on, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. The Parish Council object this application. We support democracy. And when the original application was approved by just one vote at its third committee meeting, we respected that decision. 
However, it soon became clear that what was being constructed was not to the approved plans. So, along with residents, we raised concerns with enforcement who confirmed things were not correct. At this point, most builders would stop and correct their error. Not in this case, and the build continued to completion without appropriate planning permission or any dialogue between the developer and parish council. Every aspect, apart from the size of the building, borders on minimal standards, on plot density, separation to neighbouring properties, parking, etc, etc. The officer says the space between the new house and one home stores is 13.6 metres and policy states a minimal gap of 13 metres. However, he then goes on to say that the chimney reduces the gap by 0.5 metres. So now we have a gap of 13.1 metres, just 10 centimetres above minimum. In reality, it's actually 12.2 if you measure it. It is important that these distances are seen in the context of our village generally. A gap of 13 metres separation might be fine as a general policy for a new housing estate, where everyone knows what they're getting when they buy their house. But this needs to be viewed and assessed for each location. In our historic, well-established village, gaps are much bigger than that. Our parish plan survey highlighted the things residents value, with space between properties and space around the village being mentioned many times. The lack of separation is compounded by the overbearing roof height being at least half a metre higher than the approved application. You notice there are no floor plans showing the additional bedrooms and ensuite in the roof space that was previously refused. You can call it a three bedroom house to reduce the number of parking spaces. You can add conditions to remove permitted development, but there is no way to enforce the number of rooms being used and number of people and vehicles. Taken overall, this is a proposal which is out of character for our village, goes against our approved parish plan and will have a detrimental impact on the private amenity of the residents at number one home stores meadow and others. The officer states how the council cannot monitor developments and his statement sets a very dangerous precedent that developers can build whatever they want with minimal planning approval. 30 seconds. This developer has done exactly that and we are left to suffer the consequences when he walks away with his profit. We urge you to refuse this application. Councillor Reynolds, thank you very much indeed for that. So members, do we have any questions? Apparently, Councillor Rolf does. <laughs> uh, yeah, can I ask, um, at what point did you, uh, were you aware that it was, the roof was going higher and there was another floor and did you at that point uh, uh, go to enforcement at the District Council? Enforcement have been involved quite a few occasions. We initially noted the footings were further forward than they should have been. Then it gradually went up further. And then it was obvious when we saw skylights appear. Enforcement, we keep on to them and our local ward member will know we've been on to them. Any other questions, members? No? Councillor Greenall, thank you very much indeed for your time and your patience this evening. <laughs> OK, our next speaker on this item is a Mr. Derek Diggory. Good evening, Mr. Diggory, and welcome. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Now, you'll have three minutes again. I'll give you a 30 second warning. When you're sat ready and comfortable, if you press the button in the middle, it'll turn your microphone on, should go red, and then the floor will be yours. I am here to represent the residents of the neighbouring properties. We wish to highlight the numerous planning breaches made by the builder and to express our disappointment with many of the de decisions made by the planning team. <clears throat> the initial application was made in 2018 and withdrawn on the advice of the case officer who had concerns relating to the height, massing and separation between the proposed property and those adjacent. We believe that the planning procedure would be fair and impartial to all parties. We have found, however, that after the submission of several retrospective applications, planning and enforcement have continually found in favour of the builder. A new application was made and approved by the planning committee in 2019, albeit with a greater mass and height than the one that had been withdrawn. The permission given was for the construction of a three bedroom 19th century cottage style dwelling, 
Very quickly, we realised that the builder had no intention of following the approved plan and he proceeded to build a three-storey, five-bedroom home. Enforcement and planning were both notified and as a result, further retrospective application was made. The builder's agent claimed that the reason for so many breaches was that the builder had misunderstood the approved permission and also used the wrong plans. This excuse would be quite laughable were it not so serious. The new dwelling was sited two metres forward from the agreed position. The roof height had been increased by 0.55 metres. This was done so the builder could add an extra floor to accommodate two additional bedrooms and an ensuite bathroom. The chimney was built externally instead of internally. Five roof, roof lights were installed, etc. We believe that with so many changes, planning and enforcement would take some strong action. This was, however, not forthcoming and the builder continued to ignore the restrictions with seeming impunity. One of our major concerns now is the completed roof height. In the withdrawn application, it was deemed too high at 7.25 metres. The approved plan is 7.85 metres. The finished building has a supposed height of 8.4 metres. In fact, we estimate that at 8.7 metres. At the very least, we would like to see enforcement make the builder reduce the roof height to a level that corresponds to the agreed plan. This is an opportunity for the planning committee to show that developers cannot take advantage of their planning approvals and it would act as a warning to those wishing to flout the rules. My final thought is to emphasise what the Department for Communities and Local Governments say about retrospective plans and I quote, these are primarily intended for those who have made a genuine mistake and wish to rectify and legitimise that mistake. It concludes by saying that unauthorised development is unacceptable and unfair to the majority who abide by the rules. We residents are abiding by the rules. So I would ask all of you, ladies and gentlemen, I appeal to you, your sense of fair mindedness and trust that you will come to the correct decision and refuse this application. Thank you very much. Mr Diggory, thank you very much indeed. Members, do we have any questions? Do we have any questions for Mr Diggory? No? Mr Diggory, thank you very much for your thank time you and contribution you. and your patience this evening. Okay, let's move to our next speaker on this item, who is a Miss Miranda Rogers. Good evening and welcome. Thank you for your patience. Uh, Miss Rogers, you've been here many times before. You know the drill. You actually have six minutes today rather than three, so um, use as much of or as little as it, as it as you like. Whenever you're comfortable, the microphone's on. The floor is yours. Good evening. Uh, you have heard from the previous speakers that there are many objections to the application before you. It is regrettable that errors have been made. But as your officer's report states, the developer's conduct or intentions and the council's handling of previous applications are not directly relevant to the determination of the application. So the starting point in considering this proposal is to acknowledge that planning permission has been granted at committee for the erection of a three bedroomed house in 2019. If the application were put to you today in its original approved format, the re result should be the same. There's been no change in policy since the original determination and there are no material considerations which should indicate an alternative decision should be taken. Since then, you've had two almost identical very applications to regularise the changes that have been made through the build process. The changes ma made were in the main of limited significance. They are summarised in your officer's report and I'm not going to go through them again. The reasons why the changes were made are not really relevant. So the first application, very application, was refused in February this year for highway safety reasons only. The as-built property, as you heard, increased the ridge by half a metre, thus provided five rather than three bedrooms. Three bedrooms meet the requirement for two car parking spaces, increase in number of bedrooms to four, and you need an extra space. County Highways stated the site could accommodate three parking spaces without hitting the building, with which we didn't agree, but anyway, uh, and as such concluded the scheme would have an unacceptable highway safety impact. On all other matters, including impact on the street scene and on neighbour amenity, the scheme was deemed acceptable. There were no reasons for refusal on anything other than highways. The matter was referred to your enforcement team, who in an email to the owner said, you're not going to like this, remove the roof lights, return the property to three bedrooms and we'll be happy. So the owner did that. He took the roof lights out. He's tiled over them. They don't exist anymore. It's an attic space. It's got no bathroom. It's got no water connections. It's got no heating. It's just like the attic space in an awful lot of houses, which will probably be filled with Christmas decorations. 
The removal of the attic bedrooms returns the house to three beds and a requirement for two parking spaces. A swept path analysis of the site was done by David Tucker Associates. It showed that two MPVs, seven seated vehicles, can enter, park and exit in a forward gear. The scheme therefore complied with your development requirements, SPD. This was deemed to overcome the single previous reason for refusal and a revised vary application was submitted, which is now before you. The house now proposed in terms of size, position and appearance is identical to that considered acceptable by your officers in February. The only physical difference is that the roof lights have been removed and internally the property now provides three bedrooms. Your officer's report undertakes a detailed analysis of the scheme, taking into account the fallback position of the scheme approved in 2019, which would still be approved today. It acknowledges the concerns of local people and the parish council, but concludes, as did the refused application, that the scheme will not have an adverse impact on neighbour amenity or on the wider character and appearance of the locality. All the relevant standards set out in your developer requirements, SBD, are met, and visually the property respects and reflects the immediate locality, the heights of the nearest properties and the setback within the street scene. Highways was the only issue for the first very scheme and at the request of the County Council an independent road safety audit was prepared with the County Council witnessing two MPVs entering, parking and exiting in a forward gear. No adverse impact was identified and County Highways was able to withdraw their objection. There can now be no substantiated objection to the proposal on highways grounds. So to summarise, principle of a three bed dwelling established by grant for planning permission in 2019. Highway safety, previous obje objections clearly overcome by a stage three safety audit and witnesses. Neighbour amenity, this is the same scheme that was considered in February 2022 that was refused solely on highways grounds. There is little difference from the approved scheme in 2019 and all of the council's SPD standards for amenity and privacy are respected. Character. The dwelling is little different to that previously approved. It's identical to that which was confirmed to be policy compliant in February 2022. Taking these points together, the proposal accords entirely with the development plan. There are no material considerations which indicate an alternative decision should be reached. And as such, I would ask that you now grant planning permission. Thank you very much. Well, within your time, members, do we have any questions from Ms. Rogers? No, I have one, if I may. Um, I went to the site visit today um, uh, and made my own observations about various things. The visibility displays, do you currently have sufficient visibility display? And if you don't, do you need to do work on either trees or bushes or hedges in order to achieve that? Yes, there is sufficient visibility display. OK, that's all I need. If Thank you very much. County Council would object. Thank you very much. OK, um, we will call our next speaker of the uh, for this item, our last speaker of the evening, who is Councillor O'Donnell. Councillor O'Donnell, good evening and welcome. Thank you for your patience. Um, I think you know the drill. You'll have five minutes. I'll give you a 30 second warning before your time is up. Otherwise, whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, and good evening, committee. I would first would like to start by thanking Paul and Alice for their patience and compassionate approach to this um, application, which has been really difficult to navigate for the local residents of Pillerton Priors. And um, it's a shame that we have not heard from the developer or their agent at any point as either a ward member or as a parish council. And just for correction, the visibility displays are hedges owned by WCC, and therefore you cannot guarantee there'll be a timely trimming of those in order to maintain the visibility displays. You'll also be aware that Michael Gove MP has stated that unauthorised development is unacceptable and unfair to the majority who abide by the rules. And you'll no doubt also be fully briefed on the February 22 case in Warsaw, where Warsaw Council actually ordered the demolition of an unauthorised scheme because it did not reflect the specific planning permission that had been granted. You have already heard the details and concerns raised by residents in the Parish Council, so I don't need to revisit the increased height of the building, the insertion of first floor windows and roof lights, which are merely tiled over, not completely removed at this point, and the alteration to the layout of the site, including the reposition of the house a whole two metres in front of what was granted. When considering this case, I'd ask you to consider how your wards would actually react to this. 
In Pillerton, Priors, this has caused huge unrest amongst our local community. It raises local residents' <coughs> concerns regarding the teeth of enforcement, the strength of the role of a parish council, which we know is really valuable, and the true ability of our planning team to oversee and advise you planning applications from start and vision to actual completion. It's pretty galling that the original planning um, application was not in agreement with the parish plan or the local needs housing needs survey, which has specifically specified smaller um, properties are required, not the five bedroom one that was put in. And I recall that planning meeting when the original scheme was passed by one vote. At that meeting, Councillor Kettle asked if gates were needed to protect animals and children who may run out onto the road because the property was going to be so close to a very busy road. Well, it's now a whole two metres closer. It may have passed a road safety audit stage three, but that relies, as I've mentioned, on Watch County Council trimming in a timely fashion, which may not always be possible. Um, there are justified concerns that unless you actually remove the extra roof space and remove the roof lights rather than merely tiling over them and the reported stairs, which is access to those extra rooms, there is always the extra the, ex, the risk rather of the extra two bedrooms reappearing. And I refer back to Warsaw, where the council leader specified anyone who doesn't build within the permission they will have been granted will feel the full force of planning enforcement with the support of the courts if necessary. We take direct action against people who build something outside the permission they have been granted. For us as a district, this development could signal a really dangerous precedent. By there being no consequences for applying for a three bed and building a five bed with ensuite, by picking a footprint for a property then moving it two metres closer to the road, by raising the roof height and blocking out all natural daylight to a neighbour, for the true extent of this not to be punished in some way, I fear, is placing a stake in the ground and advising all other small developers who fancy their luck that the wild west of build whatever you fancy is open and ready for them to ride roughshod over local parish plans and any advice from the SDC planning team and, for the, and us for enforcement simply don't worry. So therefore, I urge you as a committee to utilise your extensive expertise and send a signal loud and clear that rules are there to protect our local communities and they are strictly adhered to and respected and highly relevant at Stratford District Council. Thank you. Councillor Donald, thank you very much indeed. Members, do we have any questions for our ward member? Councillor Crump first. I've got two. Well, one's a statement, um, one's a question, and one might be a bordering on a statement question. Um, I'm, I'm concerned about um, the comments about the visibility spires, Councillor O'Donnell. We've had something in the, the report that the, the initial rejection, objection from the county has been removed. Um, and the agent has said the visibility spires have, have been agreed. Um, so therefore, without any evidence, I can't see how we can contradict that they've got these visibility spires agreed. So your comment on that. And my other comment is I'm concerned about when I hear a, a statement which says punish. We're not here to punish. We're here to make the decision on what's in front of us and make it on planning rules and requirements. Not here to punish. We might not agree with what's been done, but we have to follow the policies. So apologies if that's not a question. Would you like me to respond to that? Is that a question uh, or a statement? If I change that you, punish to O'Donnell. protect. Thank you, Councillor O'Donnell. I'm not sure that was a question. I was trying to discern what the question was. This is a point. Yeah, Councillor Crump, wait. Yeah. This is an opportunity for us to ask questions, not to make political statements or other statements. I'm not saying that was a political one. It was a statement. If you've got a question, I'm happy for you to ask a question. But if you, but if you haven't, then we'll move on. I will ask the question, do you think we should be here to make decisions on what's in front of us based on planning applications rather than a desire to punish uh, alleged breaches? Let's change, let's, let's play semantics and change punish to protect. We need to protect our local residents when there are planning applications that have been granted and then you change them willy-nilly without actually engaging with your local communities and without actually respecting the planning procedure. We are here at an extra application because the applicant did not respect what had already been granted in the planning permission. So let's play semantics and change punish to protect. Does that answer your question? I think we're going to leave it at that. Councillor Rolfe. Um, 
Thank you, Councillor O'Donnell. Uh, I, I listen very carefully to what you said because um, about a year ago I had something very similar. So uh, what I want to ask you is um, what solution do you as the ward member are representing uh, your residents around? What solution would you like to see come out of this? What What is it you would Councillor like Rolf, to see? Um, we, we're not here, I'm sorry, but we're not here to look at solutions. We're here to consider what is put in front of us. Um, so I'm not going to allow that okay. question to be asked. If you've got a different question, by all means, ask it. No. Thank you. Councillor Cargill. Councillor O'Donnell, the agent mentioned that the only um, difference between the 2019 application and this, the, the, the actual constructed building was the uh, the, the two bedroom, or sorry, the three bedroom, two car parking spaces. Is that correct in your view? Back to the 2019 original application that was passed. Well, no, because the position of the house has changed. It's two metres further forward. The roof height has changed to accommodate the extra bedrooms, which I do think is highly relevant. Um, and in order to access them, there is a reported um, staircase as well. So it's about the fact it was changed from a three bed cottage application to what became five bedrooms. And that structure is still there. Major, but the agent has stated now that that is now clusters attic space. Well, forgive me, Councillor Cargill, but on, on track record, I don't trust that that is simply attic space. It's a very high attic. OK, do we have any more questions of our ward member? Um, Councillor O'Donnell, do you know if the building has been occupied since it's been built? I can't answer that question, I'm afraid. OK, and you referred to the, I think, the bushes and the trees at the front of the form part of the visibility space to be in the County Council's ownership. Uh, is, are you absolutely sure that's County Council and not neighbouring residents? I just want to be clear. I'm not criticising anything. I just want to be no, My understanding clear. from discussion with both Parish Council and looking at um, correspondence with um, WCC, it was our understanding that it was WCC, but you can seek further clarification on that. My understanding was it is WCC, which but is why we're concerned about timely trimmings. It, it's your understanding ours after. Thank you very much. It doesn't appear there are going to be any more questions. So, Councillor Donald, thank you very much for your time and contribution this evening. OK, let's move to points of clarification. I assume there's going to be a few. Councillor Roth. Um, yes, so uh, point of clarification. So if if we as a committee were to grant this, um, what is to um, prevent the applicant going for permitted development and reinstating the upper floor? Glad you asked, Councillor. My condition, uh, recommended condition 11 in the report, which removes permitted development rights for uh, extensions, dormers, roof lights and porches. That's classes 1A to part, sorry, part 1, classes A to D in the general permitted development order. The effect of that is they won't be uh, anybody attempting to put a bedroom in the roof space would have to submit a planning application to be determined on its own merits before they could put in any roof lights so it would be pretty dark before they could add a dormer so that you know they could see out um also before they put a bedroom on the ground floor in an extension for example or um, all of these things basically would increase the parking space requirement which is why we don't want them to do that so they they can't provide three spaces so we want to stop that equally we don't want any development forward of the principal elevation because that would reduce the space available to parking as it is so we remove rights for porches as well any of those developments would therefore have to come in for a planning application we would look at that and given the justification for it I th i'll leave it at that i think given the justification for it it would be a fairly obvious decision for the case officer if i may just follow on from that before i bring in other members that have signaled um am i right in thinking that notwithstanding the uh, fact that the roof height is, is higher and the front elevation is closer to the road. Um, one, once permission has been granted and, and a, a property built, internal changes are entirely open to the individual owners and occupiers to do. So in theory, that attic space could be turned into rooms. Um, it's 
but what, by removing the permitted development, what we're basically doing is preventing any natural light to get in there, short of having a full application. Is that a fair assessment? That's correct, Chair. Yeah, um, we can't directly control what people do, what what sort of works people do within their houses, because it's not development. It's not it's not an act of development that requires planning permission, so it doesn't come anywhere near us. What we can do is do it indirectly with this condition. Thank you very much, Councillor Adam. Please. Uh, relative to can I see the photos uh, real quick, please? Uh, and related to that is um, slightly confused over the definition that's been given in terms of removing the roof lights and tiling over the roof lights. Is the roof light structure still in situ or? So the, you can see you can see one roof like that. Um, if we just flip back to the plan for, plan for a second, you can see that that roof light is there. That serves an ensuite bathroom. Uh, which is here, which is on the first floor. So the other roof lights that were here, which in this photo would be there and the other side, um, they've they've been removed. Uh, I, I, I should stress that I haven't been into the roof space. I, I haven't. I can't see what's in there for myself, but I've looked at it from the outside. They're certainly not there on the outside. Okay. I just. Do you mind just uh, leaving the the front elevation photo up? Yeah, yeah great. Thank you, Councillor Harvey. Yes, thank you. Um, there's clearly an immense amount of frustration and dissatisfaction with what's gone on. Can I ask the officer? And I hope this is not being too pedestrian. Could I ask the officer, in relation to the description of development, could he go through? line by line and give a, a, a thumbnail sketch of what the question is that we are being asked to, what the variation is in practice that we are being asked to agree to. And could he also confirm or, or not that if we um, if we find that we, we can't accept or we don't want we don't wish to accept one or more conditions, is this all or nothing? This is an application where if one leg falls, it all falls, or do we have to agree one way or the reject or uh, accept all the variations? But I'm, I'm most keen that members of the committee absolutely do understand what variation is being asked for. Uh, certainly. Um, probably uh, easiest to sort of illustrate it with the, the plans whilst the talk. So, this is the baseline. You, you've heard earlier applications mentioned. They they were withdrawn. The, the, this is the baseline. This is what the we're comparing the current application to. So the important parts on this on this picture basically are the heights um, and the window arrangement. Again, if we flick on, you can see I've circled everything that's a change basically. Um, the height has changed here in the bottom left, um, which is to say the chimney has become shorter and the ridge heights of the remaining two uh, of the larger and smaller ridge have increased. Um, then we have this external chimney breast that was previously, that's the same elevation that was pre previously internal. We have two bedrooms in the roof space. They're no longer there, so ignore that. The roof lights, no longer there, ignore that. So this is what we're looking at now. Compared to the first application, 5.3 metres is the distance there. It's now 3.6 metres, so it's moved closer to the road. The hedge has also moved slightly closer to the road. Um, but that's so that's change number one. It's close to the road. Change number two is external chimney breast. There's some windows that are in different places. Nobody's interested in those. Nobody's nobody's objected to those. They don't cause any issues. And that's it. So it's the it's the heights and the, the distance to the road. Basically, that is those are now the changes. Um, an external chimney breast, I suppose, is also caused some comment. External chimney breast, distance between house and road, and uh, heights, roof heights. Thank you. Marvellous. Thank you very much. Um, anyone else have any points of clarification? Councillor Rolf? 
Uh, yeah, so just going back to the external chimney breast, uh, obviously it wasn't on the original application. Um, what's your view on that? Is it is it is it something that is in keeping with with the village? Uh, is it is it do, do we have um, do we have can we demonstrate that elsewhere in the village that there are external chimney breasts? Yeah, it's it's not something that I've picked up on as as being a particular priority in the parish plan or an, or any other um, sort of local policy. Um, there are other external chimneys elsewhere. Furthermore, it's kind of tucked away around the side. It's not really okay. visible in the streets. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Councillor Adam. Uh, very quickly, I, the plans that you got up, are you saying that these are the most recent ones submitted that are meant to reflect as built? The the plan on screen now is, is that, yeah, yes, councillor. Um, whether it does or not is a matter of enforcement rather than us. Because, yeah, that, that was my follow on, because yeah. the photos seem to differ slightly but if it's an enforcement matter I'll leave. any more for any more i've got one um obviously went on site visit today i made certain observations there's one in particular i want to check before we move forward if we're minded to grant um would we be able to put onto the i see you've, you've got a visibility visibility display condition would we be able to extend that to say that those visibility displays need to be met before occupation or in, if it's already been occupied no later than three months from the date of permission uh, yeah in, in my view uh, chair yeah um, it would be useful to know for sure whether it has been occupied because we, if, if it has hasn't been occupied then we could just use the, ex the existing condition if not then yes a timed trigger would be would be possible okay I've, I've just been observing again outside out here and and i can see the agent is shaking the head and saying no it has not been occupied and that's just been confirmed again so i think if we're minded to that i think we should consider that um i uh, council ralph you're going to rue the day i ever subbed on this committee aren't you um so um if this if this committee were minded to object to this application uh, can, it's a question I asked um, Councillor O'Donnell, but can you answer? Can you answer that? Is is it feasible the roof can be reduced in height? Is it feasible? I mean, clearly it's not feasible the entire building can move back to the original position. But is it feasible the roof can be reduced in height? I'll answer that question. Yes, I, our enforcement have the ability and facility to be able to enforce what has been approved. What has been approved is not what is there now, and they will take it through the appropriate process. OK, to... so so for further on, so can they can they also enforce repositioning of the building? Yes, of course they can. It's Thank within you. approved plans. Thank you. OK, I think we can move to debate now. Who would like to kick us off? Councillor Kendall. Thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> I think Councillor Rolf has really helped me there at the end. The question is, and I didn't ask, ask you points of clarification, but the question which has been sticking on my mind, which is, what if we refuse? Well, absolutely, you're quite right. Um, we, we're empowered to you know, go through enforcement and to, if that means demolish, that means demolish. But what will happen before we get to that stage is the applicant will appeal. The entire application will go to an inspector who will look at this and say, is it justifiable? to make these people tear down the building, move it back to where it was. Is it justifiable to take the roof like down? I'm sorry, but I just don't think the, the inspector will do that. I think the inspector will look at what's there and come to pretty much exactly the same conclusion that our officer has, which is, it ain't great. There've been lots of mistakes along the way, and it's really not fair to the residents of, of Pillard and Priors, but he will eventually, or, he, or she will eventually go for it. So with that in mind, I'm going to propose we grant. Councillor Harvey. I'm going to put the exact opposite point of view <clears throat> because um, there, is, there is clearly frustration and anger amongst local people that what had been, uh, uh, first of all, the, the, the decision was narrow in the first place, fine. It was made and that's what you have to go with, that's fine. Uh, the application was granted on the basis that a certain building would be built in a certain position with certain facilities. Uh, and 
I, I, I would rather uh, we refuse this application and if the applicant wants to take it to appeal, take it to appeal. Because there are times when you put a stake in the ground and you, you vote for what you really believe in. And I really believe in this application being, the, the application that was originally approved is what was approved. What is there now is not what was approved. And if, the, if it means demolition, that's fine by me. The, the, the issue for me is uh, so strong that I, would, I don't normally willingly provoke an appeal. But for me, this is one of those instances where we have got to stand on the basis of what was approved. This, this, uh, this offends um, the policy. It offends a lot of people who are fair-minded, reasonable people. And for me, I, I am strongly of the view that this is one for once that we should not accept the officer's recommendation. Um, even though I suspect he would argue that it's, it's well, well argued. For me, this is one that needs to go to appeal if necessary. Councillor Harvey, can I assume that you are making a proposal to refuse? I think I better. I think you're better. <laughs> I'm going to accept that. So I'm going to accept that as your formal proposal to refuse. What I am going to ask you to do, because I don't necessarily disagree with what a lot of you, uh, a lot of what you've said. However, I haven't heard any planning reasons to why as to why you're refusing it. So I need you to think about those. We will continue to have the rest of the debate while you come to that, and then we will come back to you should we need to. Councillor Curtis, please. Thank you. I'm not necessarily me yet um, seconding the, the proposal, but I do agree with a lot of the sentiment about what has been said. And I think, you know, you don't accidentally build a house two metres forward from where you've been given planning permission. You know, these these aren't accidents. These are deliberate um, choices that the developer makes. And if they make those deliberate choices to flout the planning permission that's been given, then I think they should, the, you know, there will be consequences. And I, I think perhaps too often we err on this committee on the, on the side of, oh, well, you know, it's only a metre here, it's only a metre there, it's only a minor infringement here, it's only a minor infringement there. Um, so, yes, I'm not yet seconding, but I am minded to. Um, I'm going to take slight umbrage with what you, the last part of what you just said, um, only a metre here, only a metre there. Um, my view of the committee and the way we make decisions is based on what's put in front of us. Um, the way Retrospective planning applications wind me up beyond belief. And that is why I fully support the sentiment of Councillor Harvey's, uh, what, what Councillor Harvey had to say. Having said that, there is a planning law and, plan, uh, and a process in which we go down that allows for retrospective planning applications such as this. We then, in essence, are viewing it as a new application in its current form. So it's not a question of, Oh, it's only a metre here that's been added, only a metre there, we're not going to do anything about it. It's a question of we've gone through a process, enforcement has been taken, an application has been invited, an application has come in. We are now considering the pros and cons and the planning policies related to that item. It's within your gift to disagree with the officer's recommendation, but I would err on the side of caution when we say this committee looks at a metre here or the metre there and dismisses it. We don't. We follow proper process, and that has to be clear. Can I, can I just come, yes, I, I'm sorry. I, um, I didn't mean to be at all pejorative about the way this committee works. Can I just clarify that for all members here? Thank you. Councillor Dixon, please. Thank you, Chairman. Reasons why we could refuse it if we are so minded. A situation whereby uh, looking at the Footprint is moved forward by two metres. Um, impact of that, a shorter front garden and a longer back garden. Uh, marginal, I think. And I don't think that has, has had any impact upon the neighbours. Obviously, it has reduced car parking space. But then again, as a three bedroom property, which is what the application is before us, uh, there is sufficient parking 
available at the front now to meet that requirement. So to my mind, the only possible reason we could give for refusal is the increase in height and whether or not we regard that as now being overbearing on number one home stalls meadow, I think it is. Um, and a question for Paul. Um, obviously, the ridge has moved. Is the pitch the same? So are the, is the, has the gutter also gone up by half a metre? Or is the, are the walls still the original height? Uh, because it will have a, a slight impact upon the, uh, the overbearingness of that gable wall. So the question, if I can just check my understanding, is have has have the eaves gone up as well as the ridge effectively? Uh, yes. Council Foreman, I think you saw your hand go up earlier. Is no. that right? No. no. Council Crump, oh, yeah. then, please. All right. Um, so we are in the debate, aren't we? Not asking. Yeah. Yeah. Just a couple of things. Um, um, Zay, I will get to the point eventually. Um, I'll just could refer to Councillor. Um, Brain's gone. Oh. Catch the half is. Um, I'm, I haven't got my glasses on. No, I haven't got my glasses on. So my eyes are tired. My eyes are tired. So. Um, just because the decision is narrow, it doesn't dilute its legitimacy. And we've had two narrow planning decisions tonight, 6 5, and went in the planning balance. And I disagree with them, but I fully accept those decisions. Yeah, because we went through the process and did it, uh, discussed it properly. And I'm sometimes concerned about the language that was used. You know, councillors have a duty to ensure residents are, are aware what a planning application covers and what a planning committee does. And I'm happy for us to protect, regulate, legislate, and if necessary, prosecute or enforce where it's reasonable and legal to do so. But I don't like to hear the word punish at this committee. And if that was a slip of the tongue, I'm happy to accept that. Protect, that's fine, but I don't think we should be using the word punish at this committee. Um, uh, thank you. So, so that, uh, you know, I've got that off my chest. I'm happy to do that, and I will stick my, you know, that comment, you know, three thick and thin. But certainly, this is a difficult one, and I can understand this. I think this will be a close, close vote. Um, it's all down to reasonableness, and again, I, I'm on the same road as Councillor Kendall. Is this reasonable to do so? And are we going down the route of a planning appeal uh, where the planning inspector will consider <coughs> all the facts as well? And it might be the right thing to do to go to a planning inspector appeal because of everything will be, will be discussed in the open. So I will be supporting uh, Councillor Kendall's. Can I just confirm that? Is that a seconding of Councillor Kendall's? Second, it? Yeah. Thank you very much. Councillor Adam, please. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> uh, something that Councillor Kendall said sort of in, in elaborating on where this process might go made me think about the other one thing that sort of I touched on. I think from what I can see, that the plans and drawings we have in front of us don't reflect what's actually been built, which means that even if they, at least from what I can see, which seems to be um, confirmed by you saying that the eaves have gone up as well, because I think that that's what I, I see in the photos, which would suggest that if we did approve it as they are, position on the site may be acceptable, but I think they'd still have to bring the roof down under enforcement and we'd have one would have good cause to involve enforcement within that. Now, broadly speaking, I'm in I'm in agreement with Councillor Harvey and I'm looking forward to hearing his reasons for his proposal. But my thought is that if it were approved, find the positions moved and we might not all like that. But I still think enforcement action would likely be forthcoming. That's me projecting on my thoughts and may not be relevant planning. But that it's certainly food, food for thought, I'd say, on, on this. And I'd welcome some input from the officers just to confirm whether they think that might be the case as well. I'm 
looking forward to a drink after this. <laughs> I don't know how much of that anyone got, so I, I'm afraid I'm going to have to start again. Um, what we're looking at, the plans that are in front of us and are being considered by us now, are what's been built, what is on the site. Where the confusion I think will probably have come is that we are looking at the previous application, what had been done and what has now been put in place. It gets very confusing. So I, if we are minded to approve tonight, I don't think there'll be any form of enforcement afterwards because that includes the right uh, change in the ridge height and the uh, eave height and also the movement forward. So I don't think uh, we need to worry too much about that. Um, before you come in, Councillor Off, I'm very conscious of the fact that it's now 10 to 10. We have gone on way too long. I want to bring this to a conclusion as soon as possible. Let me tell you what I observed on site today. From the neighbouring garden, the garden, and forgive me for the gentleman whose garden it is, is not desperately long. It's not desperately short, but it's not desperately long. Any form of development behind the hedgerow is going to be, is going to have a negative impact. The question I'm wrestling with is, is that additional, I think we're set at half a metre, going to have a significant overbearing impact over that being half a metre lower? That is what I'm trying to wrestle with in my mind. I'm also very conscious of the fact that the exit onto that main road, whilst a visibility splay can be achieved, what I observed today was it's achieved to the left as you're exiting, but is not achieved to the right without significant hedge cutting and or removal. It's something to be mindful of. Now, we've been told by our ward member that that is in the ownership of WCC, Warwickshire County Council. Warwickshire County Council have not provided an objection. So we can reasonably assume that they will create enough these things is going to get thrown in a minute. Uh, no, I'm still speaking. If it's relevant after I finished, then I'll ask you. The what I observed, as I said, was the, the, with the fence line. What I understood from conversations um, and questions that I asked today is that the hedgerow and the fencing is not in the ownership of Warwickshire County Council, but is in fact in the ownership of the neighbouring property. So we need to be mindful of that. I understand that, that neighbouring property is objecting. So whether those visibility splays can be achieved or not is in question. If we're minded to grant, and I'm going to ask the proposal in a second uh, to add this, I think we must have a condition that says the vis visibility splays need to be achieved before occupation, i.e. those bushes and trees need to be removed. That's my view. Um, I will leave it open to you. Um, given we have had a proposal and we're going to move to a vote on that now, we have had a proposal to grant and it has been seconded. Are you happy for that visibility display condition to be added? Yes. Are you happy as well? Good, thank you. I'm sorry. I've tried to be as gentle and welcoming to everyone as I possibly can today. I'm not accusing you guys of causing problems. We've had people shouting out earlier on. We are trying to conduct business and we're going to try and conduct business properly. I told you I'd come back to you when we were done. I wasn't done. Shouting is not going to help. Councillor O'Donnell, you have an opportunity to come back for a point of fact. If you'd like to come to the front here and speak into the microphone and give us that point of fact, that would be helpful. Thank you, Chair. And I think the reason they were shouting out is because this is relevant to your um explanation just then. It's my error. The hedge is not Warwick County Council. It's actually one of the residents at the back. That's why he was shouting out. It's Mark's hedge that he would not be prepared to move his advised. I think I'd already said that. So whether it's a civil matter as to whether or not uh, the resident wants his fence removed. As I said, what I want to have in here is a condition, if we're minded to grant, is a condition that says visibility space must be achieved before occupation. If that requires the residents fences to be cut down or hedges to be cut down that is a civil matter between him and the uh, owners of this land it is not a condition or a consideration for this planning committee okay just for clarification he's not going to remove it so there won't be even a discussion on it for him 
that's not relevant to the planning committee. Councillor Curtis, if you've got something, please be quick because it is now nearly 10 o'clock and we need to make a decision. Just to clarify then, that it seems from what Councillor O'Donnell has said, that the visibility space cannot be achieved because that... If the visibility space cannot be achieved, the property cannot be occupied and enforcement action will be taken. Thank you. Uh, obviously, that is to the discretion of the enforcement team, but action, they will have to uh, go through their relevant process. Right. I think we've done it to death. Can we please move forward with a vote? The proposal is to grant in line with the officer recommend. Sorry, very quick. Are we going to move permitted development rights? It's a condition on yeah. the report, yes. The proposal is to grant in line with the officer's recommendation with the addition of the vis visibility displays being achieved prior to occupation. Could I please have a show of hands for those in favour of granting? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And against? One, two. And abstentions? Two. two. Committee therefore resolves to grant application 22004748 Barry in line with the recommendation and with the additional conditions. OK, uh, members, while the members of the public are leaving, um, we do have one final item to go through. Um, and I, I do, given we're here and we've taken a vote to continue, I'm conscious it's 10 o'clock. Let's just get on with it. Application reference 2201984 FUL, that is 47 Ludington Road in stratford upon avon Our presenting officer is Paul Thompson. Right. Uh, yes, yeah, a householder application in Stratford. The only reason we're here looking at it is because it's a council employees is the applicant. Uh, we have one uh, objection just talking about, um, as you see, yeah, rear, rear, rear conservatory, fairly standard issue. Uh, one objection, just a bit worried about construction traffic blocking his driveway, which is uh, there. Um, that's a standard uh, construction issue. Uh, no other objections, no other concerns raised by the case officer. Uh, that's what it looks like. Uh, over to you. Paul, thank you very much. We have no speakers on this item. Uh, do we have any points of clarification? No. Um, can I propose that we grant in line with the officer's recommendations? Have a second there, seconded by Councillor Kendall. Could I have a show of hands, please, those in favour of granting? Oh, cool. Unanimous. Unanimous. Thank you very much. Is there any urgent business? In that case, members, thank you very much. I know it's been late. Thank you for your time. Officers, especially and particularly our COVID patients, thank you for your time as well. And we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Bill. Nice to see you.